Okay, guys, how you doing? <clears throat> Invite people. I think we're gonna get a we're gonna be involved in a debate. Let's see. All right, so let's do this. Let's find something. Unitarian may be showing up, so just hold on, guys. I'm just preparing. Hopefully he shows up. We're waiting. All right? So, guys, invite people. We may have our Unitarian friend, Andrew Griffin, show up. Uh, he agreed last minute to discussion because he wants to have a discussion on John, other stuff, obviously because he wasn't too happy with his performance. Pray that Jesus Christ, my Lord, will constrain me to be compassionate, filled with the love of Jesus, and bold to refute arguments and to capture his heart i pray we'll see 1611 good to see you man did you get to watch my live streams yesterday and the one i did earlier well uh, the one earlier i don't think so but what's up radioactive you're radioactive baby <clears throat> yeah same gentleman i debated so we're waiting for him in the meantime you feel free to call but before you call yeah it was very in-depth on being born again. You'll enjoy it. I, I'm sure. I hope you enjoy all the sessions. You're a blessing to me and the Lord Jesus bless you and your family. Bless everyone. <clears throat> In the meantime, before you call, let's just pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you. And Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We need you, not just for these sessions. We need you to live for you, to trust you, to love you, to be in love with you. Father, guide this conversation, anointed by the power of the Spirit, Grant me clarity of thought and speech. Recall the passages. Interpret them correctly to destroy all lies and distortion of the truth so that Jesus Christ will be glorified and bless us, Father. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with the Spirit. Bless the internet connection. And use me to convict this man to fall in love with the true Jesus. Father, we need you. Lord Jesus, shine through us. Holy Spirit, fill us. We ask in Jesus' name. Save me from error and righteous anger and fill me with passion and knowledge and wisdom for the glory of Christ and bless your people in Jesus' name. He's here, guys. Let's do it. All righty. Let me, let's call him. Hold on. Sorry about that. Let's get it ready. Come on, where is it? All righty. Should be calling, so pray. First, last, you ready? Post verses. <clears throat> Just pray for my voice. The Holy Spirit, fill my lungs, my chest, and throat with the health I need. So go ahead. <clears throat> From Tom to a debate. All right. All right, good. How you doing, buddy? Can you see me? It's okay. Oh, right. yeah. Hey, you go, man. What's up, buddy? Hey, how you doing? Let's see. Let me get this, this, this thing working right. You're good, man. Better looking than me, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, all right. Hold on, man. Sorry, man. I'm getting problems too. There okay. we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I've been here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hold on. Let me just say, because I'm on my live stream as well. well uh, you should be. Okay. That's good. Everyone can see. Just want to make sure. Because I was doing a live stream Q&A, but why not just engage together? Okay. You can hear him? I don't know. All right. All right, friend. What's up, my friend? What do you guys, what do you want to discuss? Uh, well, at some point, I'd like to, to, you know, discuss some things about concerning John, but you said you wanted well, to you know, talk about some old, how God appears in the Old Testament. No, no, right? it was talking about plurality of God in the Old Testament, but let's take John first. Let's go with John. Sorry about my throat, man. I'm not young anymore. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah, my throat is not what it used to be, but we trust the grace of Jesus Christ. All right, guys, we're going to. He's going to ask me questions about John. I'll ask him about John, and we'll go from there. What's up, my friend? So what's your first question or comment, statement? Go ahead. Yeah, so I think, I think. well, I have two questions. Sure. One, one is one that I haven't really looked into. Every time I do a debate or talk to a, a different Trinitarian, they'll have a, some sort of new verse that they bring up okay. that I've never really heard in an argument before. Your particular one was, I think it was John 8, 34, something about Abraham didn't do this. You, yeah. you guys are trying to kill me, but Abraham didn't do this. So I'd like you to go. I mean, that might tie into your, 
your Old Testament thing. Maybe you could show me exactly where there's some intertextual yeah, sure. um, John intertextuality 8, actually, there. Sure. It's uh, mm -hmm. the passage I was referring to, John 8, 40. I don't know. Do you have your Bible with you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, if you can read, because what one thing, if you haven't listened to me in sessions, I usually have people read verses for me. That's the style I've been accustomed to. But if you want me to read, sure. I'll read. But go to John 8. Now, if you yeah, want, got it. okay, read from 39 to 41. <clears throat> All right. So they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But you are trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from, from God. Mm -hmm. This is not what Abraham did. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to read 41, finish it. That's up to you. <clears throat> oh, yeah, sure. So you are indeed doing what your, your father does. They said to him, we're not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. Yeah. And add 42 just for a good measure. Just add 42. Sure. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Mm -hmm. So now what, what do you want me to show you from that? Because you asked me what passage and well, what's the point? So what? Feel free yeah, to so I, what I'm saying is that, okay, so do, are you aware of any Old Testament um, passages of where, where this event may have occurred? Several. Do you have a specific one in mind? I have several in mind. Uh, okay, great. Genesis 15. Genesis 18 and a couple others, but which one do you want to go to first? Uh, whichever one would show specifically, yeah. the, um, sorry. specifically this <clears throat> this instance of where of where you know Jesus may have come yeah. to them. I guess yeah. is what you, that's what you're, you're, you're saying. That Jesus came to them, yes. but Abraham didn't try to kill Jesus. That's right. right. Now, just to make the point clear. I tied it as in with John 118, which in the brologue, you tried to depersonalize the word, which is fine. <clears throat> but just to make clear that in John 118, the point that went with this passage in John 8, 56, 59, if you read John 118 and read it in your, in your particular, I, what version I read, I don't care. I just, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't care. I use any different versions. I, could, I happen to have, uh, still have uh, in our SVP. Okay, that's fine. Go to, right, no. go to John 118. The only reason why I ask about this passage is because you are aware, and I don't know what your position is, that there is a variant reading. <clears throat> Some translation, like yeah. New Revised Standard Version, will say, God, the only Son, sure. has made him known, has exegeted it, has made him known. But I don't know if you right. accept that reading. Do you accept the reading, God, the only Son, or do you accept the reading, only begotten Son? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with, with, with the... Earlier manuscript, uh, unique. Yes. How I understand it is unique God or the unique Son. Yeah. Okay, but unique Son. That is the, the the variant, and I'm not trying to make it about variant readings. There are two readings, and well, there's three, but the two dominant ones, Monogenes Theos, and then you have Monogenes Weus or Weos, the Erasmian pronunciation. However, you want to render Monogenes, it's Monogenes God or Monogenes Son. Your New Revised Standard Version, if you pay attention to it. Read it for me, and I'm going to tell you what they did here, so you can see what they're doing with it. If you go to John, it says no one, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made Him known. Now they're taking the words monogenes and theos as two nouns, <clears throat> two descriptive nouns, two descriptions of Jesus. They're not taking it as only begotten God or unique God. They're taking it as He's God, and he is the only son, because they're taking the two nouns as two descriptions. And I'm not trying to get technical, but it's not a noun and an adjective. In other words, monogamous is not telling you the kind of God he is. Your translation is saying he is this and he's that. He is God, and he's the only son. So, But I don't know if you agree with that rendering. No, I, I don't. I don't agree with it. Which, which, my question for for the Trinitarian would be, uh, how, if if you how well, for one, how do you understand it? How do you read it? Well, I I do go with the only begotten Son rendering, but <clears throat> my understanding is clear that Jesus Christ is the one who makes God known to us and gives us mm -hmm. access to God and permits us to see God. Because apart from mm -hmm. Jesus, you cannot know God nor see Him, and this mm -hmm. is a work He's been doing not after the incarnation because. John qualifies it by saying at any time. 
So at any time you read anyone seeing God and having a relationship with God, Jesus has to be involved. He's the one who mediates that. Otherwise, we have a contradiction between John and the Old Testament. That's why I kept saying to you, <clears throat> when Abraham, <clears throat> when Jesus says, Abraham did not try to kill me, but he rejoiced at seeing me. If you have a human Jesus, you're going to have to say that doesn't mean he actually saw Jesus and Jesus actually saw him face to face. But then we're left with the dilemma of John 1 18. No one can see God and know God and be his friend apart from the son. <clears throat> mediating God's presence and giving a person an intimate relationship with God. Because that's what it says. I didn't, I didn't write John 18. No one has seen God any time. But Abraham saw God and was called the friend of God. If John 1.18 is right, that means Jesus must have been there and he was involved in Abraham's encounter with God, making Abraham a friend of God, or we have a contradiction. Okay. And I can show you where I believe because see, you, you, you take John 1, you depersonalize the word. You're saying the word was simply God's plan. But I'm going to show no, you. No, 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 no. Okay. No, what yeah, is I, the I, 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 no, that, that, was a, that was a view that I had at one, at one okay. time. So and I understand now? that that is, that is the, the common unitarian understanding. But I think if, you know, as, as I, I know, if you just say in the beginning was a plan, we can't make sense. Yeah. We, so we, who is that the doesn't word? make it doesn't make sense. Who is the word then to you? I, I still don't know. I don't. I don't think it's a who. I think I still think it's an it. What I think, it's, I think it's a it? what. What kind of what is it? Um, I think. I think it's mysterious. Okay. Right? I think it's mysterious, but I don't think it's a person. All right. Well, this is where it's going to dovetail into Jesus appearing. But if you take my interpretation, for just assume mm -hmm. my interpretation, the word is this divine person, eternally existing with the Father, who then becomes the historical Jesus of Nazareth. That's my position. Okay. Let's just argue that I'm correct for now. Let's see if I can find such a phenomenon where this word is personal and he mm -hmm. appears to Abraham which explains why when the word becomes Jesus, Jesus could say, Abraham saw me and I saw him. Let's go to Genesis 15. Let's read verses 1 to 3. And this is just of one of many. I'm just trying to answer your question. So I'm taking it step by step. In Genesis 15, verses 1 to 3. All right. All right. After these things, the, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. Now, Read verses 4 to 6, but I want you to pay attention to verse 5 clearly and carefully. Verse 5. All right. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own shall be your heir. Now, verse 5. He brought him outside and said, look toward mm -hmm. heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to them, so shall your descendants be. All the way to six, if you want, six. And he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, how do you explain verse five? He brought him outside. What does this presuppose? It said he brought him outside. That means Abraham's in the tent, right? I don't. I don't. I don't know that. We, what would you say it presupposes? I don't. I don't. See, I don't see anything that it presupposes. Well, there's no need to bring Abraham outside if he's already outside and he can see the horizon. He has to take him outside for him to see the stars. So that means he's in somewhere, and has to be like I'm in my apartment. You say, "Hey, come on out. Let me show you the stars." <clears throat> so you take me out okay. of my apartment. All right. So this is what we call a theophany, where it is a visible appearance of God, and God says, "Come on out. Let me show you the stars." I mean, it's right there. I mean, I'm just going with the text. He brought him outside. If he's already outside, mm -hmm. he doesn't need to be brought outside to see the stars. Yeah. Right? Okay. 
Okay, so, but who is the one that was inside and brought him out and told him count the stars? Who's this? What does the text say? I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily, I think that Yahweh is doing it through the means of something, yeah. but I don't think it's a second who. Yeah, but it's, it's right there. You're told who he's doing it through. Who was it? And the Aramaic, Aramaic. There's paraphrase. nobody there. Yes. It says the word of the Lord. It was right there in verse one and verse four. Yeah, but, uh, but, but that's what I mean. I think the word of the Lord is not, is not. Not a person that that's what that's my that's my view. Yeah, well, everyone can have a view. It's what you can demonstrate mm -hmm. exegetically. So I, I mean, Muslims yeah. have a view well, that Jesus is well, uh, Esau and he's well, let, let, let's if, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. A no, little I'm bit. saying Muslims have the view that um, Moses predicted the coming of Muhammad. He's the prophet like Muhammad, and that Jesus predicted Muhammad when he said the come. Anyone and everyone can have a view. It's what you can prove exegetically. Yeah. Well, I think if we back up, we go up to first one. Yes. We we see. After these things, the word of the Lord yes, came definitely. to Abram in a vision. Yes. So, so did so. I think that he's perceiving something that's going on. I think, I think the word of the Lord is essentially a revelation yeah. that Abram is having. There's only one right? problem with your view of vision, and this is I I run into this not just among Unitarians but Trinitarians. The assumption is a vision means it's something in the mind, but not something in time and space. But if you view it that way, then Paul never saw Jesus. Because I want you to read Acts 26, 19 for me. Acts 26, 19. So we oh, can't. Oh, okay, I will. I will do but that. Let me just, but when you say coming. time and space. Yeah, so you're I, saying something. I, I think in, there's. Did it happen in front of Abraham? Was it there on earth or was it a projection of his mind? No, I think that I think that this is this. This is the medium through which God interacts in time and space. One of the mediums, the other yeah, yeah, one being was the Holy it Spirit. something where it was right there on earth or was it in his mind? I know it's in time because he has to communicate to Abraham who's in time and put a mental image in his mind. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is it like, for example, <clears throat> a human being standing next to him? Is that what you mean or no? It was something in his mind that God conveyed. I think... I. Th I think it's mysterious and i think that i think that it's it's more something if that's something that's essentially impressed on his in his psyche i don't that's, know that's the proximity I, yeah. Yeah. I don't i don't know the proximity of of this okay well what, whatever it is let me let me show you why that's not how the bible defines the term vision something in the psyche if you go to Paul and he recounts his encounter with Jesus, an encounter that even those around him, they saw the light, they could hear the language, but didn't understand what was being said, and Paul was blinded. So it wasn't in his psyche. It was an event, a phenomenon that even others around him saw a blazing light, knocked him down, blinded him, and they heard a conversation, but it was in Aramaic, and they couldn't decipher what's being said. But Paul calls that a vision in Acts 26, 19. Okay. Read what he says. He says, if you want to start from 12 to see, he's talking about his encounter with Jesus. And he calls, he says it was a vision, but no one would assume it's only in a psyche. Okay. So this definition of vision is an unbiblical one. That's what I'm trying to get at. Just because it's a vision, that's the biblical way of saying God came in time and space in person to have an encounter with Abraham. It's not something just in the psyche. That's how someone in the 21st century is interpreting that word. But we need to let the Bible tell us what these words mean. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you another example yeah. of a quote-unquote vision. Let's go to Matthew 17 and read verses 1 to 5. Matthew 17. Uh, verses 1 through 5? Yes, Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. All right. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still 
was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, now notice, transfiguration. So they see him transfigure before their physical eyes. And Moses and Elijah appear. And then the cloud appears and they hear God's voice audibly. But then read 6 to 9. 6 to 9. All right. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them saying, get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So Paul calls, calls his encounter with Christ a vision. And Jesus calls mm -hmm. this encounter on the mountain a vision. But no one would deny it was an encounter that took place on a mount in a physical location. So the term vision doesn't mean something that's only in the psyche. Uh, so, so you're saying there's, a, there's only one way a vision can take place? No, Is I'm that saying you're that saying the context, unless the context makes it clear, it's a projection of the mind. That doesn't mean it's less real. But yeah, someone that's I think I think the I think the instance in Genesis is different than what's no, happening here. Not because I told you verse five says it's taking place in time because he takes them outside. That's my point of mentioning verse five. That's why I said focus on verse five. So it's not a projection of the mind, it's an encounter that's taking place face to face, where he's now bringing him outside to see the stars above. That's not a projection okay. of the mind. Okay. I, I, I think one of the things I didn't bring up in the debate yes. is is about and, and something that you said when you earlier when you were talking about what John is or I mean or what what the word is mm -hmm. and you said essentially that Jesus mediates the presence of God yeah meaning the Father yes right and I mean and God so, you understand so, I mean the Father and, right yeah i think the context i think the context is uh i think it began to be understood differently by the time we get to john um, because he says exegeted the father yeah. and that's a little bit different than just seeing somebody and okay i saw somebody and that's that's yeah, great. i know the word uh, but that doesn't help mm -hmm. the case yeah. because that means you still left with the fact no one could have understood god's nature apart from the son revealing god's nature to them so who was revealing the nature of god to abraham if jesus wasn't there that doesn't help. Oh, well, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, so I can understand you better okay. when you say nature. Yes, because if you read, it says no one has seen God. Even if I let's go with your definition and you know, right. so you can look at the lexicon. Mm -hmm. Seen can mean perceived with the mind's eye. No one has understood or perceived God. That's how that Greek. And I can give you the lexicon if you want. You want me to give you that? I mean, so, you know, I'm not making it up. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I believe you. Okay. Yeah, definitely. No I one agree. has so seen God with the mind's eye. So it means no. When mm -hmm. you say mind's eye, that means you haven't understood God. Apart from the son mm -hmm. explaining it, because so that's where we get the word exegesis. But that still ends up yeah. proving my point, because it says at any time. But Abraham mm -hmm. was a friend of God and knew God. So did Moses. In fact, mm -hmm. God says about Moses that I speak to him mouth to mouth and he sees my form. So it still stands that John 1.18 says that could not be possible for any of them if the son wasn't there explaining God to them. So we're still up I agree. with. I, yeah, I agree. So you believe the son was there? I, I agree, but I don't believe it's the son. I, I believe there's a mediation that's going on, and but that God, no one has seen God apart son. from this mediation. But the that the that the logos but, is not a person. Andrew, but one eighteen said the son did it. It didn't say the logos. Read John one eighteen again in your yeah, translation. And, 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 if, and the, the Logos was already understood before John to be the son of God, but it's in a metaphorical sense. But it's, this person he's talking about is Jesus Christ, right? Because you're not going to now tell me it's not Jesus when 14 says the word well, became flesh and the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, yeah. so it's all from 14, 18. It's now the historical Jesus. I, yeah, yeah. My, my, my view is that the entire prologue is concerning the Logos. 114 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the only begotten of the father Monogenes. Yes. Mm -hmm. and then read for me if you can 16 and 17 i mean well 15 read 15 start so let me let me let me turn all right uh 15 and Yes, 15, 15 and 16. Yeah, because that's after he said, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. 
the glory of the only begotten right, Father, sure. Maraganes, right? Full of grace and truth. Sure. But now 15 to 18, see who it is now from this point on, at least from 15, 18, who is it? All right, sure. I'm still in, in RSV. Yeah, if you keep with that, it's okay. Right. Stay with it. Sure. All right. John testified to him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Keep going. Uh, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All the way. Take that no one has ever seen God. I, I would still say the unique son. Okay, that's why. Or the unique God, whatever you want to say, who is, who is in the Father's bosom or or close to the Father's heart has made him known. So in 15, John the Baptist says, this is he of whom I said he's before me. And there's no doubt if you read 19 down, he's talking about the historical Jesus, not the logos. <clears throat> he's talking about yeah. Jesus. Well, I, I find it interesting that in this, in our SV, that they actually put verse 15 in in uh what is it parentheses or yeah because he's know. saying that john is interrupting the flow of the prologue because he's quoting the baptist it's all in the greek manuscripts it's not because it's a it's a variant reading what they're trying to tell you is yeah. from this point on it was john narrating but now he quotes the words of the baptist mm -hmm. so he's breaking the flow from 1 of 14 where it's the narrator now it's john the baptist and then the narrator resumes the discussion so from 15 to 18, it's now the historical Jesus. Because once he yeah. becomes flesh, John yeah. says, this is he, meaning who? Jesus. And then 17, grace and truth from Jesus. But now you want me to believe somehow for some reason in 18, that's not Jesus, it's the Logos. Well, I, I think that, well, I mean, in, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, this, this is something I've been thinking on. My, before I made that change, my understanding was that the Logos was... One through thirteen. So of course we read that stuff after after the logos became flesh and lived among us. It dwelled, it tabernacled among us, just like wisdom tabernacle tabernacled among the Israelites, uh, but couldn't find a place to make its home, so it went up next to heaven again and sat by his throne. Okay, no, yeah, but the problem with that is if you read what you just cited, it says that the Torah embodies wisdom. So their wisdom then finds a place in that it's the Torah, which is the embodiment of wisdom. We can talk about wisdom in a minute, but what I'm talking about is, even if I go with you, I agree with you, the Logos from 1, verses 1 to 13, is not yeah. without... And I, I, think that's, I think that's sort of the, the poetics of the whole book. Um, I mean, when we see things like, we know that bread is associated associated with food and now they're saying eat my flesh yes. we, we know that there's a poetic value to what's being said and jesus to me is essentially this word like wisdom used to speak in eight in proverbs eight it's clear clearly not a real person yeah. but it would I, speak I as it if is. it was and I, I think there's a poetic value here where I, actually john presents jesus at times as actually the word walking around among us Okay, well, okay, even if you want to say that, Proverbs <clears throat> is wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is known for poetic devices and poetic license where you personify impersonal characteristics. What you have in John 1 is not wisdom literature, it's historical narrative. And even again, if I agree with you, John 1 verses 1 of 13, that's talking about the Logos, not as Jesus, but as some mysterious way that God spoke to the prophets. Mm -hmm. From 1518, it's no longer poetic. It's talking about the historical Jesus because it mentions an historical figure, John the Baptist, and it mentions another mm -hmm. historical figure, Moses, none of whom are poetic devices. John the Baptist is sure. a historical person. Moses is an historical mm -hmm. person. Jesus is an historical person. So in 18, it's Jesus who's the son who makes God known. So we're mm -hmm. left with square one again. How could they have known God apart from Jesus the Son, because in 18 it's Jesus the Son, not the Logos, as yeah. some mysterious means of God communicating to the prophets. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I mean, that's that's a great point. I mean, I, I can see that. I, I, how I would see it, 
what I would say that the word, the logos, it tabernacled among us through the person of Jesus. And what it says, so when it says the law, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we're talking about different, um, different, um, what, uh, dispensations, you mean? Dispensations? Uh, sort of different, um, different levels of revelation. Mm -hmm. And, and so the law in the intertestament time be, became to be equated with the Torah. And, and well, but we know as New Testament believers that the law was provisional. It was a it was a, a, a provisional form of wisdom given for a certain period of time. Yeah. The Lagos was understood to be the immutable truth of the universe. Only only one right? problem so, that, that argument actually would lend itself to my point because at no point do you see where it says the law became flesh and dwelt among us and therefore it's Moses or wisdom became flesh and dwelt among us therefore it's Moses. Moses mediated the law but he's never identified as the law walking or as wisdom walking but for some reason Jesus is. So if I follow yeah. your logic, let's follow. Mm -hmm. Jesus embodies the word and he is the revelation of that word, the logos. Well, Moses also is the revelation of the law. Why isn't he not called the law in the flesh? Uh, he is. Where? Where does it say that he's the Torah in the flesh? Yeah, it's 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 in, in the intertestament traditions of that time. Moses is literally called the embodiment of divine logos um, at at that time. And yeah. now, now, well, here, now let's notice what you're doing again. You have to go outside the inspired scriptures to appeal to sources that are inspired to make your case, but the same inspired yeah. uninspired sources show that the logos yeah. is a person, not simply a personification. So we can't have our cake and eat it too. I'm sticking with the inspired scriptures, the books that we accept yeah. to be God's words. Uninspired okay. sources can be right. They can be wrong. For example, I'm positive that you're not Catholic. You don't believe in purgatory. So if I were to quote to you 2 Maccabees 12, 39 to 46, where it says Judas Maccabees offered sacrifice and prayed for the Jews who were slaughtered in battle for idolatry so that God would then raise them up and forgive them of their sins. So he's praying for the dead and offering sacrifices for the dead. You would be the first to say, I don't accept that. That's not inspired. But that's what you're doing every time you go to uninspired sources and selectively citing those points that you think make your case. So can we stick to that which we accept as scripture? I accept the Torah scripture. I accept Isaiah and Proverbs. So can you show me in the Pentateuch, okay. in a canonical writing, yeah. inspired, where it says Moses is the law in flesh like it says about Jesus? Well, let's let, let's see, though. We're, we're talking about two distinct revelations, yes. right? The law was a revelation, a provisional revelation, which came through Moses, mm -hmm. but Something else has come through Jesus Christ. There's an immutable truth that's come that's 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 come through Jesus Christ. Now we can. So I don't need to go to the intertestament literature to say, mm -hmm. well, that proves my point. All, right, that's All I'm doing is saying at that time, people essentially began to see Moses as the supreme mediator. Right. When we get into later testament, me, Moses was said to have been have chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Yeah, that's to that's be the fine. mediator of the covenant, right? We don't accept yeah. that. We know that's not well, true. We know Well, no, no, not necessarily. No, no. Being chosen mm -hmm. before the foundation okay. of the world doesn't mean Moses existed. It means that God had already planned before creation, before creating Moses, that there would be a man Moses whom he'd create and he'd appoint to mm -hmm. be a prophet. That doesn't mean Moses was there. That's not the language of pre human existence. It's a language mm -hmm. of predestination. God before creation predestined Jeremiah would be his prophet, Moses would be his prophet, and they would mediate God's revelation. So I have no problem with a source saying Moses was chosen from the foundation of the world because that's what Jesus says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, which would be my second example of the word being a person who then becomes human, not simply some mysterious agent that's not really a person, but it's not simply an idea. That becomes embodied mm -hmm. in Christ because if you go to Jeremiah 1 and you're in the <clears throat> new revised standard version You can read Jeremiah sure. 1 verses 4 to 10 for me Okay. 
I want to go back. I want to go back to the word in Moses. Yes, I, after that, well, that's what I want to do with more because yeah. I want to show, stick okay. to the canonical scriptures to show the word is not simply something mysterious. It is a person, and it's not simply embodied okay. in Christ. But in Jeremiah one, this is the second example. Jeremiah one four right. to ten. Four through ten. Yes, but read slowly because we're going to have to break it down. Well, Jeremiah one four to ten. All right, sure. Jeremiah one verse four. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I said, ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy for you shall go to all of them to whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Keep on, keep on, see what happens. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down down to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant okay now you see nine it says the lord is appearing to him in a visible form because he says he stretched out his hand and he touched my mouth that's yes. physical contact and he put his words in his mouth right it's right there in verse nine that that's that's what it appears to be on, on, I mean, on the on this on this level of the text. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know how many more levels we can dig into, but it's clear. But yeah. then you I don't think you caught it who this Lord is that appeared visibly and had a physical hand that physically touched his mouth. Verse four, the word of the Lord came to me saying. So the word is speaking. How does the word speak? That's in Jeremiah one four. I, I think it's what's being revealed. And I think the language is 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 figurative. It's about what's being revealed to the prophet. It's about what's being communicated rather yeah. than well, like a... Well, now you uh, have a problem because in the context, yeah. the Lord appears and then says, I put my words in your mouth. So it's not simply God's mm -hmm. revelation because that person is there touching him physically. And he goes, this physical act, that's what symbolizes I'm putting my words in your mouth. So here's another face-to-face -face mm -hmm. encounter with a person that's appearing in human form that Jeremiah is actually seeing and actually touches He's been touched by him. Uh -huh. And it says that person was the word of the Lord who came saying. So I want to know how does the word say anything? Because it's in Hebrew, the word yeah, is sure. speaking. It's speaking and appearing visibly. How's that? Okay, possible? so well, well I so I can clarify how you view this. Are you you seeing this as as a vision? A dream or are you seeing it as something other than a vision or a dream? Well, we've already defined that even if it's a vision doesn't mean it's not reality. So, Well, when we point. hear God speak to Moses, he says, I speak to you in a different way yes. that I speak. When I go to the prophets, I, I speak to them in visions and dreams, but that's not so with my servant Moses. Yeah, but he doesn't. Right? He did not say in John Numbers 12, 6 to 8 that <clears throat> he never, ever speaks to any prophet apart from a dream and a vision in that particular context. But that context is actually problematic for your position because now you're admitting Jehovah <laughs> appeared in a cloud and not simply in the mind as a dream or a vision to show Moses his form and speak to Moses directly. But then we, we, we are left with the problem, John 1, 18. How could that happen without Jesus doing that? Okay, let, let me clarify. Let me clarify what I say when I mean psyche. And what I said is, is that somehow something is impressed on his psyche. This could be through some spiritual medium. Okay. It, he could be having something. It, it could be that he's having a visitation of some sort. There could be something so happening in the space-time continuum. Okay. But I'm not saying that it's just, it's just uh, uh, you know, because we get into human nature and we, and we start seeing it. It's not something that comes from inside of him. It's coming from something that's outside of him, yeah. but it's still impressed on his psyche. Okay, so but now with your example of Moses, when he says that, he's saying that to Aaron and Miriam, and he's in a cloud. So are you now admitting that's an actual visible appearance in a specific location on earth to Miriam, to Aaron, and to Moses? Because you you mentioned that. I didn't. That's Numbers 12, 5 to 8. 
And there mm -hmm. he appears in a cloud that even Israel saw the cloud and he mm -hmm. comes down. And in that coming down, it's at a specific location on earth, the Sinai wilderness. And he tells them and they hear him audibly. And he says, Moses sees my form. So according to you, because he says to other prophets, I appear to them in dreams and visions, but not so Moses. But then that goes back to my point. That means it's something that he's doing in time and space in an actual visible manner. And Moses is seeing that visible shape of God because he says he sees mm -hmm. the shape, the similitude of Jehovah. Shit. And he's speaking to him mouth to mouth. But then we go back to John 18. That cannot happen apart from the sun doing it. So I'm back to square one again. Mm -hmm. How is that possible without the sun? Yeah, John I, I think that by the so 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 we, we begin, I, I think it's. I think there's there's a lot that we miss when we jump from Exodus or Numbers. Historically, that's a lot of time in between the events of uh, Exodus and Numbers in between the time we get to John. So how people, I believe, how people understood it by the time it, we get to John is that they, they, they see seeing God as more of understanding him rather than solely through a vision here so how you ask how what, yeah, but what type of vision uh, occurred andrew, real, real quickly in, andrew yeah uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh we just agreed that according to that interpretation of a vision that doesn't apply to moses because you just said he said to moses mm -hmm. to prophets i appear in dream and visions not so to moses so we can't ap appeal to vision yeah. anymore what was Moses seeing? It's not a vision. It's not a dream. You I, you mentioned. I don't that. know. Okay. I, I, so you don't, don't know. know. That's fine. You don't but, know. But but I. But 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 I I think that the context is telling us that it's about revelation and not simply that he saw something because we see later on that no one can see God yes. and they'll die and then we read about Moses mm -hmm. and God's like listen. You're gonna see the backside of me, okay. and I'm gonna I'm gonna appear in the cleft of this rock. So there has to be a distinction in the ways that God can be seen. Okay, but you you just said it's a revelation. God is not; He didn't see God. But then you said, yeah, there's a way in which God can be seen. So which is it? Can He yes. be seen in some sense, or He cannot be seen? In some sense, yes. Okay, absolutely. so then that, that's my point. Did Moses uh -huh. then see, quote unquote, the back of God, where He says? It's not just revelation. He goes, I speak to him mouth to mouth, and he sees the similitude, the form yeah. of Yahweh. Yeah. So he yeah. is seeing God visibly, and it's not in a vision or a dream. So Mike goes back to my point. Since however they understood it, in light of the New Testament, which cannot contradict the Old Testament, but explains the Old Testament much more deeply, John is telling us that happened because of Jesus the Son, because it could not happen apart from the Son making God known. So, do you believe that was Jesus there? No, I believe. I believe. I believe that is. The, I believe that. Well, I, like I said, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how he saw him, but we we, we see there is a distinction between seeing God because when Moses actually face, right? just saw the back side of God, right, his face was illumined, right, his face yeah. was radiant. But what right. I'm saying, uh, Andrew, it's it didn't say you can't see God. It says you can't see my face, Exodus 33, 20, but you can see my yeah. back. So okay. he didn't say you cannot see God. It says you cannot yeah. see my face, but you can see my yeah. back. So God didn't say you can't see me in yeah. any sense. There's a sense in which you can. There's a sense in which you can. Yeah. So even in that sense which you can see God. That sense cannot be true apart from Jesus. So we're back to the same point. Any sense you see God, like when Isaiah sees Jehovah on the throne, and he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes, my physical eyes, not my mental eyes, mm. have seen the King Jehovah of hosts. Any sense in which you see Jehovah, any sense in which Jehovah speaks to you, any sense that you have a relationship with Jehovah, Jesus has to be involved, according to John one eighteen. So we're back to the same point again. Well, I think that I think that you may be correct, but I still think that you assume that it has to be his physical eyes. No, he said it. My eyes. What eyes is he pointing to? It's Isaiah six verse five. I don't five. know. I, I think that there's definitely. Would you, 
would you admit there's at least a possibility that they would have understood it to mean something different than physical eyes? Not if the language suggests otherwise. I can only go by the language. Isaiah didn't have to say, my eyes have seen Job. He could have just said, I've so, seen Job. That would have been open to debate. So you're saying it's it's possible, but you don't think it's no, likely no. based on I don't the think text, it's possible. If saying. I go with the exegesis, I can only derive my theology from the text. Jo okay. if Isaiah didn't need to say my eyes if it wasn't something he saw physically. The fact he did means that God who inspired Isaiah wants me to get the point. He saw him with his physical eyes. That's the only way I can interpret yeah. the text. Now, if I come to the text with a presupposition that this can't be and that can't be and only this can, of course, then language means nothing. And if you really listen to yourself, Andrew, and I'm saying this respectfully, no matter what the text says, it can't mean that. It may mean this. So if I follow your route, the Bible is the most incoherent babble ever produced. So you make a case. You make a case that we need now an infallible magisterium to tell us the meaning of the Bible because the Bible is too difficult for us simpletons to get. I, I get you. I, I get your point. So let me explain. So if I come to a text, that that's just how my reasoning works. I, I've never found a place yet where, where the Bible contradicts itself. Agreed. What I have found is many places in the Bible that I don't fully understand and that I could know better. And so when I come to something like this, I'll question it and I'll investigate further. Now, I haven't done that con concerning this particular and, and really sat down and thought and researched and looked into how they understood it, what vision and, and what it means if there's a possibility he saw with his physical eyes or if there's another meaning to it. Now, when we get to John, mm -hmm. but we John know that if there's different ways of seeing God, yes. you, you, you admit there, there, there's at least no, possibility, but, but you're saying it doesn't matter. And you're saying it doesn't matter how they saw him, that they couldn't have seen him apart yeah, from the sun. But, but you're exactly admitting there's different saying. ways of seeing him, right? Yeah, no, it's, it, there's no debate on whether they saw God in their mind, in a vision. That means not in time and space, but something that was real, but something only that person can see. So God lets me see something in my mind. I'm seeing something real, but only I can see it. Others around or where God appears. In front of a bunch of people, we all can see it, like what happened with Paul. Any form yeah. whatsoever God takes, or okay. according to John, the word anytime, that's the nightmare. John 1 18. No one has seen God anytime. No one has perceived God anytime. No one has understood yeah. God anytime. No one can know God at any period without the Son explaining Him. We're stuck with John 1 18. But if you let John explain it to you, Isaiah did see Jehovah with his physical eyes because the Jehovah that appeared to him was Jesus Christ revealing the Godhead to Isaiah. That's how John takes it. But then if we don't let John tell us his belief about Jesus and we've already assumed that John believes a certain thing about Jesus, then that too will be explained away. All right. So you said, and not, not, not to debate, but no, just so right. I can clarify, if, no, if, if you debate, say that Jesus reveals the Godhead, yes. is that a particular person or is he revealing, is that the, the Trinity as a whole? As Jesus you is the one who allows you to see him, the Father, and the Spirit. In other words, if you see the Father, it's because Jesus allowed you to see the Father visibly. If you see the Spirit, that's because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Because it's not only Jesus who's been seen. The very Bible says the Holy Spirit has been seen, and he's been seen visibly. And I'm sure you know this, right? Uh, well, you, you speak about, about an Acts no, that we're referring three, to? Luke. 322 where it says the Holy Spirit appeared in bodily shape like a dove. That was a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. Yes. Right? Okay. And then right, John 132 but, 33. Okay, but, but real quickly, okay, John 132 33 says John saw yeah, the Holy Spirit. Right, right. So is right. that not and, the Holy Spirit yeah. being seen? Well, well, most most versions translate that. I know in John, the Spirit and it rested on him. So a lot yeah, of Yeah, but even God is it's, called it's an just, it. What does that okay. mean? God is called an oh. it. Where do you see God called? John 4.22. I'm curious, just curious. John 4.22. You, oh, okay. you, yeah. you Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we Jews sure. worship what we know. Calling God a what? Okay, good point. Sure, right? good point. I got, I got you. That's a good so point. Before you move on, just I want to make this clear. <laughs> Pronouns are irrelevant in establishing personhood or denying personhood. It's irrelevant. It's the context that will demonstrate whether a thing is a person or impersonal. So when you keep saying it, 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 even in 1 John 1, we're told Jesus is in it. Because it says, that which was from the beginning, which our eyes have seen, our 
And he calls Jesus mm. a that and a witch and an it. That yeah, well, that's nothing. what I would say. It's, it's impersonal. And that, but you do make a good point that needs to be addressed yes. Yes. concerning John 4, 22. But I'm not, I'm not equipped to do that uh, okay, at this point. Fine. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, but anyway, so... Now, if you want to talk, you have any more questions about John or we can, and unless you want yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, yeah, so back to the thing is, is what you're saying is that you are saying that there is at least two different ways is that God can be seen. One could be an internal revelation and the other could be a revelation that takes place where everybody can see it. Would you oh, yeah, agree I, with that? Yeah, uh, two God possible can, ways? can project something to you, to you, like in a dream or in a vision, mm -hmm. no one else has access to or sure. God can himself appear in actual earth himself in a visible form, a shape, like the Holy Spirit when he came down in bodily shape. Th that there was something that John, Jesus saw, whoever was present. They saw that phenomenon and it lighted on him. So it's not something only in Jesus's mind that only Jesus saw, whether a dream or vision, or in John's mind that only John saw. This was something external to their mind so that others there could see that phenomenon. So God can do it that way, or he can appear to your mind, and it's still a true revelation. I'm not denying it, it's valid. But any form of any way you see God and hear from God, Christ has to be involved according to John 1.18. So it doesn't matter the way. I mean, even in Daniel 7, Daniel 7 sees God the Father, and then he sees the Son of Man. He's given a view, vision of the future, the exalted Christ as a son of man entering heaven to receive a kingdom. But in that vision, he sees God the Father and the Son of Man. And there's the key. The reason why he's allowed to see God the Father is because the Son of Man is there whom he sees, which again confirms you cannot see any person the Godhead without the Son being involved. That's Daniel 7, but, 9 and 10 and 13 and 14. Okay, but that's a that's a vision of a future event, right? Well, still, even if it's a it's still a vision that is reality in the sense that the Son of Man did go to heaven on the clouds, did enter the Ancient of Day, His presence, and did receive a kingdom. So whether it's future, still, what's the point? Notice for Him to see the Father, Jesus had to be involved. That's my point. Because He did see the Father visibly, Daniel 7, 9 to 10. The Ancient of Days is not the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus. Okay, so, so okay, so, so verses like if you if you're saying the Son has to be involved, so there there's two persons or two sure. figures involved in Daniel seven, sure. and the, the, the Ancient of Days and the, the Son, Son of, of Man. Man. Do you agree that's the Father um, appearing visibly? Uh, what do you? No, I, I I think he's having a vision, so he's just seeing it. And that the vision prophetic is he realm. seeing it visibly? Visibly? Uh, I think that somehow it's being impressed. Upon the point is psyche. Okay. That, that's all I know. What, but we just agreed. Even if it's in a psyche, it doesn't mean it's not real because you don't deny that Jesus no, as was I the son of man who rode the clouds, right? Uh, in, in the in the are you talking about the, the vision of Daniel twelve? Because he's seeing Jesus going to heaven to yeah. receive his kingdom. So from the New Testament perspective, th did Jesus really ride a cloud as the son of man? Yes. Okay, I think so, so then I think that's that was real, that, right? Uh, uh -huh. That was a real. Okay, What's that? so so that was really Jesus. He really looked well, no, like no, a son. No, I think no. I think he's. I think he's having a vision of a, a future event. We have to decide that. That's irrelevant. We have to decide. Was he seeing an event that was? Yeah, well, it's, still I, my I point. Think not, I think. I, uh, maybe I think I'm not that, clear because we're going far, Jeff. Maybe I'm not clear. Even if it's the future, it's still a future revelation of a future reality that really happens. So just even though it's in the future, because God transcends time, he can show you the future before it happens because he's not limited to time. When he sees in the future a son of man riding the clouds in heaven, the New Testament then describes the actual fulfillment. Jesus is really the son of man who really did mm -hmm. fly on the clouds and really did enter heaven because you believe sure. Jesus is in heaven. Right? Sure. Sure. So then, yeah, did yeah. He, then why are you simply trying to say, well, it's a vision in the mind, and he saw the Ancient of Days. That Jesus going to heaven was a vision in his mind, but it's still a reality. It still really took place the way he saw it. So God was showing him an actual reality. That doesn't mean there aren't yeah, so symbols in Daniel. 
But we have to decipher when something is symbolic, because the text will explain it, and when something appears as it is. Sure. And I believe it's an actual event that, that Daniel is seeing. There may be some symbolism, but that's kind of irrelevant to, to what we're well, talking no, about right here. Well, no, it's proving my point. Notice why he could see the Father visibly, because he saw the Son. That was the point I'm making, whether future, past, yeah. or present. There is no okay. seeing the Father without the Son. So we're stuck with John 18 again. Who yeah. did Abraham speak with? Whom did he see? Whom did he eat with? Whom did Moses see? Whom did Isaiah see? Mm -hmm. Who? Yeah. Well, so so that's that's what I'm. That's what I uh, good. Uh, I got you. Yeah. I understand. So, but I be I believe the context of John 18 lets us know what what we're talking about here. Well, when it says that no one has exegeted him, sure. no one has explained him, no one has explained the he's in an intimate position and he has explained he has explained the father. What, what do you what do you what do you take it to mean that he has explained? Well, when did he the explain father? the father? Because it says no one has understood God any time. So how did they know God and have a relationship with God in the Old Testament? So that well, I think I, I think the Lagos, the, I think the Lagos explained God. But it says the son did. It's not the Lagos. It's the historical Jesus that's being referred to in 18. So we're going back to that yes. point of 15 to 18. In, in, eight, in 18, it is. In, in, so, in 18, it is. I don't think that. But that's after the Lagos became flesh. So why, so would, something I assume, that was, why would I assume that the Lagos is not an actual divine person who becomes a human being when you just said that this is the Logos who became flesh, which you're making my point. So the Logos, before he became flesh, the one who revealed the true nature of God to God's servants, he's the one who doesn't simply, he's not simply embodying Christ, he becomes Jesus Christ. But you don't want to take it to the next point because you just admit Jesus, the historical man, is the Logos, but then you're saying, no, it's simply the embodiment of the Logos. It's like you want to have your cake and eat it too. Is the Logos that person that becomes a human being? Or is the human being simply the embodiment of the Logos? Because John 18 says that historical human being, the son, he's the one who makes God known. Why the disconnect? I think the Logos is said to tabernacle through the person of Jesus. It doesn't say he through. It says he became flesh. He actually became flesh, and his yeah. flesh body is where he's indwelling. So it's not okay. he simply tabernacles through Jesus because that can be said of you and me. The Logos tabernacles through me when I preach the word, study the word, believe the word, and affirm the word. But it's saying something yeah. different about Jesus. But you don't have the depth. None of us, no human being other than yeah. Jesus, has the depth of revelation that Jesus had. And so now, does Gabriel and Michael have that depth? Who no. with how, well, hold on. No, no, think. Before you say no, think about what I just said. According to you, the historical Jesus came into existence at a later point in time. But Gabriel and Michael have been with God before the creation of the earth and mankind. Yeah. If anyone has the depth of God's being and has seen the fall of Satan and have seen the consequences of sin and have seen what Adam and Eve did, it would be Gabriel and Michael. So yeah. they do have the depth the depth of God, in fact, on a greater level than a human Jesus could ever have. So why aren't they the embodiment of the Logos, according to your logic? Uh, let's see. Oh, I may just froze up on me. You're Every welcome. time I switch out of Skype, it freezes up on me. I can hear you, though. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yep. Do you understand all my right. point? Because now you're saying yeah. it's all about depth, depthness. Jesus sure. had the sure. depth of God's knowledge on a level that no one else has. Well, he doesn't have that depth on the same level as a spirit creature who's been with God from before the creation of Adam and Eve. So are they the Logos embodied? No. Why no, not? I, no, I, well, according to you, why not? What's that? According to your definition of why Jesus is the Logos, why not? I'm going by what you said. I just Be, said the Logos is in the, me. The, mm -hmm. Because the Logos is in me when I study the word, believe the word, and proclaim it. You go, yeah, but it's not to the depth that it is in Jesus. Well, the Logos isn't in Jesus to the depth that's, that is in 
Gabriel and Michael. So are they a greater embodiment of the Logos? No, no. Well, one, they're not flesh. Um, but two, flesh is right. I don't. Right? I, I mean, so, so, yeah, no, they, they didn't. They don't have the depth that, that Jesus has. But how? I mean, how I see where not? you're going with that. No, but hold but on, I, I don't understand this. Let me, I'm like, I gotta understand. How can they not? When they've been with God much longer, they've been in his presence, they've been in fellowship with God and have loved God much longer than Jesus ever had because your Jesus came into being at a moment in time. Gabriel and Michael were there before Adam and Eve. How can these two persons who've enjoyed God's presence, been in fellowship with him, hearing directly from him, carrying out his commands faithfully and in love with him, mm -hmm. not have a greater depth of the Logos than Jesus? Well, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think this is pertaining as to human revelation. That's that's why it says something, some form of revelation came through Moses, but another form came through Jesus yeah, Christ. That revelation now, was mediated through angels as well. Angels came and communicated yeah, but, God's revelation to humans. Gabriel did it for right. Zechariah. He did it for Mary. He did it for um, Daniel. So that's not and, a, that doesn't help me see your case. But yeah, well, I mean, what, what we're talking about revelation to human beings. And so angels are, you as you know, they're messengers. Mm -hmm. So they're given a message and they're sent to deliver a message. Yeah. And All right. So Jesus, do, right? Is the, Jesus is the embodiment of the revelation of God as a human being. He's both the messenger and the message. Okay. So what makes him the message? Because his life is the his life reflects the the supreme truth of the universe. What what about his nature? Because now this is where I'm going to get confused with the Unitarian position. What about his nature made it such where you can embody God's word perfectly, flawlessly, when that's never been the case for any other human creature, not even Adam, prior to fall, prior to sin, Adam was flawless like Jesus. How was he able okay. to pull it off? Um, well, one, I believe because he was chosen to do so. And two, I believed. Um, but Adam was that, chosen to be God's image bearer and also have uh, dominion over yeah. God's physical creation. And when yeah. he was chosen, he was flawless and perfect. Uh, well, well, well I'm, I'm not talking about his nature. I think we, we, but you agree that Jesus was fully a human being, right? I have, uh, of course, but he's also truly God in the flesh. I have an answer why but, he could be flawless, but I'm yeah, forget okay. about my position. Yeah, well, I'm trying well, to use well, your logic. Yeah, well, well, two things. One, we read in the book of John that Jesus was given the spirit without measure. Okay. So this is Jesus given the eschatological amount of the spirit. So he's given a higher amount of the spirit than anybody. The why? spirit is what empowers us. Yeah. To My question see was, into mm -hmm. the mind of God. Okay, but two things. Number one, why give him the fullness of the spirit and not, let's say, Moses? That's number one. And number two, that you're talking about the baptism where the spirit came upon him to empower him. How did he do yes, it up until the baptism? How did he do it from when he was a baby till he was 30? How did he get away without sinning? I think uh, he just he just chose to do it. So what what was it about his nature that made it possible for him to do it? And no other human being has been able to do it. Not even an atom with a perfect body and a perfect nature in a perfect world. And he failed. He, he, he chose to do it. I don't I don't I mean, okay. yeah. a lot of Unitarians explain it that because he was born of a virgin, that his sin had I mean, that his flesh had some sort of nature in which it wasn't prone to sin just like I, adam right i don't well, adam was I don't born of the dust that was virgin dust and no one had defiled the dust from which adam came but, so that wouldn't answer it either yeah not yet I, what i would say is that simply that christ chose not to sin and that god i loved him because he chose not to sin so god's love was conditional upon jesus's obedience but beyond that that still leaves the mystery i choose not to sin and yet I still succumb to sin. My goal is not to wake up in the morning and sin against God. I don't want to sin against God. I want mm -hmm. to honor God, but I fail miserably. Now you're going to say, well, my nature is tainted. Okay, put that aside. Well, we go back to Adam again. Adam, virgin dust, perfectly designed, fresh from the manufacturer's own hand, had the breath of life animating him, seeing God face to face in a perfect world, and he still failed. And yet this human Jesus, this merely human Jesus, somehow did it. What was his secret? 
I don't know. You don't know because you keep insisting that Jesus can only be a man, no more, no less. Well, then, but but at the same time, then you assume it's because he was God. So here we have two exactly. assumptions. But my assumptions anchored in the Bible. That's why I can show you that he is God because he can do what only God can do, which is why he can be impeccable and flawless. So okay, at least but now my we're, we're kind of delving off. I'm okay with that, but let's make sure we have the other part wrapped yeah. up. But I don't think we're going to make it very far with this conversation, this part, this this Which aspect. The Jesus being God part? You want me to not talk passages with Jesus is God? Uh, no, no. If we, if we, if we, if we're ready to move forward, I, I welcome it. That's great. Whatever you want to what, do. What I'm, I'm saying, I'm we're, not, we're not talking about. We're, we're talking about potentiality to sin. Yeah, and Jesus had that potential. So, yes. And yet, for some reason, according to you, a merely human Jesus, even without the fullness of the Spirit coming upon him, from the time he was born till thirty, managed to escape. So he didn't even have a sinful inclination, not even a sinful desire. I think he did. Yeah. You think he did? I, I, I would say that wow. if he's tempted in every way, that, that that's only significant but if he had the potential it. to sin. Or Finish the passage. This is what happened. He didn't say he but, was tempted. He yeah, said he tempted but, with, without sin. Yeah. he had. He, so he was tempted to. So the, the, we're talking about, about the temptation. Yes. If he didn't have the potential to sin, I would say the potential is the, the, uh, okay. the temptation is insignificant. Okay. Two, two responses. Number one. I'm not asking if he had the potential. From the time he was born till he was 30, he never sinned in his heart, never had a sinful. Does that I don't know. I, I think that's an okay. argument from silence. I, no, actually, I think we don't the Bible is quite clear. He's been impeccable and flawless because he's the holy one from his conception. That's what the angel said. He's the holy thing. But secondly, you again assume that if you're tempted, that means you must have the potential to sin. You just condemn Jehovah as someone as well. Maybe I should ask this. I don't know what you believe about God. Do you believe God, the Father, has the potential to sin as well? And to define sin there. Meaning he can have a desire to sin, but he overcomes it. Well, however you define temptation. If I tempt you to sin, you're saying you have the potential to sin. Can God have the potentiality to sin? If, <clears throat> or he has no potentiality, so that means no one can tempt him. Well, I think we're getting back to human nature here. No, it's not just human nature, because what you said was, if Jesus could be tempted, then he must have the potential to sin. I want to know if you're going to stick with that because the Bible says God has been tempted all the time. So according to you, he must have the potential to sin. I think the dynamic is different. If Why? you want to bring up some verses where sure. God has been tempted. Yes, I can. But only question yeah. is, it's going to affect the translation because you and I, I don't know if you know, but I'm going to assume you know, the word translated tempted is also translated tested, but it comes from the same Greek and Hebrew words. So, for example, if I tell you, go to Psalm 106.14 in the New Revised Standard Version. Read it in the New Revised Standard Version. I'm going to read it in the King James. And it's the same Hebrew word that in some places is rendered test, other places is rendered tempted. Okay? Same Hebrew word. Psalm 106.14. You can read in the New Revised Standard Version. Watch here. I'm going to show you something. Phyllis, please. I'm talking to someone in text. Here. Phyllis, don't chime in. You, let me deal with this, and I'll get back to you, Phyllis, afterwards. Sorry, I'm just talking to somebody in text. Go ahead, brother. Read uh, Psalm 106.14, the New Revised Standard Version. Okay. 106.14, Psalm 106.14. But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness, and God put to test and put God to the test in the desert. Now let me read the King James. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. They tempted God, and it's the same word. That's why the King James rendered as tempted. So that word tempt is also translated <clears throat> test. It's not a different word. So here God was tempted in the desert. Go to Deuteronomy 6.16. Tested to sin? No, just the same way that God, Jesus was tempted, and yet he could not sin. Any temptation but the, but against the God would be a sin. I'm, but the, there's a different... A Difference form of testing it appears. I haven't looked into it, but yeah. there's nothing about God sinning or having the potential well, no, no. to sin here. Okay, just saying he well, let, me, let me let me uh, let me let me address that. When yep. when Satan tells Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle because God would command his angels, what did Jesus quote to him? You shall not tempt the Lord your God, right? 
Sure. What was what was the temptation? What was the nature of temptation? Was that a sinful one? Because Satan is instigating Jesus to tempt God. So this is tempting God in a sinful manner. No, I don't. I don't so think then what so. Is it? Well, then what would be wrong with it? Why is it called temptation? What well, you're saying? So if I tempt God, it's not sinful. It's not. A, it's not. An, yeah, it's. A, it's not going to have. It's not giving. It's not God putting it. Good putting God in the predicament of where him questioning or, or reasoning should i sin or not no. well it is because you're putting god in a predicament to do something that was contrary to his prescribed will because here the jesus, god's prescribed will for jesus wasn't for him to throw himself off the pinnacle and put on a display god's prescribed will for jesus was to be humble and assume the status of a servant and not come with with pomp and stance so if he did that he would put god in a situation to go against his prescribed will and that is sin mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what is the context okay. in which it's Well, said? I mean, the reason why I mentioned that is because Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. And there it says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massa. So they did tempt him and shouldn't do so again. What's my point? Just because someone is tempted doesn't mean he has the potential to sin. You can tempt God all day, all night. He will not succumb because he has no sinful proclivities. Similarly with Jesus, just because you can't tempt Jesus, he cannot sin, which is why he passed the test. That's the point I'm trying to make. I, I see I see the point. I don't think it's valid, but I, well, I do see where I mean. you're going. Well, then you, John 5, 19, you have a problem with John 5, 19, because Jesus says he can do nothing on his own initiative, but he can only do what he sees God doing. So if Jesus could do something sinful, so could God, because he just said, I can only do what God does. John 5, 19. The language is explicit. John 5, 19. The son cannot do a single uh, thing on his own initiative. He can only do what he sees the father doing. So if Jesus could do something sinful, so could the father, because Jesus said, I can only do what he does. So it is a valid point. That's John 5, 19. Well, so, so the bottom line is you're saying Jesus did not have the potentiality to sin. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's a biblical teaching. I, I, I disagree, but okay, I'm, I'm glad we understand each other. Fine. I think that's great. How long has it been now? We've been because I enjoy this discussion. How long has it been? Yeah. Seriously, uh, I haven't been taking time. It's been. I have no idea. Um, okay, it's been seventy-two minutes. If uh, if you want to ask me questions where Jesus is called God, we can discuss it. If not, maybe we can do a talk on Marlon because Marlon is here. We can set up some for him because I do want to also take questions from other people. Because I think we've we've hammered this part about the Logos and Jesus. So if you have another question about Jesus, like say, is he called? We can do that. Because I want him to talk about something else. Not because I'm not interested in this, but it's been 72 minutes on the same subject. Is Jesus the Logos? Is Logos the Jesus? Or is Jesus simply the embodiment of the Logos? So if you want to ask me a question, is Jesus called God? If so, where? And is it functionally? We can address that. It would be a new question. Still relevant. That's up to well, you. I, I think that... Um... Yeah, I mean, so so go, going back to just uh, just okay. two things, I just All like right, to, to, to address real quick. Um, so when, when, coming back to the the other point about Abraham seeing Jesus, are, are yes. you are you saying that that the the verse yes. we, we we went over is you saying That's so one. so Abraham could have tried to kill? No, Jesus. Jesus. Is saying, no, no, Jesus saying. Abraham did not kill, try to kill me because he loved me and was glad to see me, unlike you who are trying to kill me. No, it's not he could have. The Jesus' point is the exact opposite. When Abraham saw me, he, he rejoiced to see me. He was happy to see me. He was elated. He loved me and was my friend, unlike you, that you claim to be his children and you're trying to kill me. Um, okay, and so if so, you're connecting those two to John 8, 56 through 8. Yeah, when, yeah. when do you see that that Abraham rejoiced? Uh, the fact that God appeared to Abraham. That would have been a moment of but, rejoicing. From Genesis 11, if you read 22 to 32 and then 12, it says the Lord God appeared to Abraham. And when God told him to leave the home of your father, and so he gladly did it. So that means here is a divine encounter in which Abraham responded to God in faith and not oppose God like the pagans did. That's what I take. That's how I take yeah. it to mean that he was, ex when God appeared and God showed yeah. himself, Abraham rejoiced that God has made himself known to me 
And you are my God. I'm your servant. I'll do what you ask. And he did what he, that was faith. That's what Hebrews 11 said. So that's what I yeah. think. That's what I take it to mean. Yeah. God's revelation. I think there's Abraham. a lot of different. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. You finish. Your I think there's a lot of different interpretations. And I, yeah. I think that yeah. when it talks about Abraham rejoicing is that Abraham laughed when God told him that he was going to have a child. And, and what chapter so the was Jewish that? people, um, I'm not sure. Every time I go on my web browser, it freezes yeah. up. But uh, Genesis 17, when he was told he's going to have a child, he laughed, not because of excitement, but because he was incredulous. This is yeah, why but, he said, well, uh, that's why he right. said, he goes, oh, that Isaac would live before your sight. It wasn't a laughter of joy. It was a laughter of incredulousness. Like, no, I under, right? Yeah, I understand. But there's a lot of commentators and a lot of people who would say that certain Jewish people, especially around that time, I'm yeah. say that this is what's being referred to because they say that they saw they understood Abraham's laughter as rejoicing because the Messiah was going to appear because a yeah. child would be born to him. So if we connect that yeah, and no, say that well, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, we're speaking about a future two, event. And that's why he rejoiced. Two responses. We're again appealing to outside mm -hmm. sources that may or may not be true because they're not inspired. Like you said, this is how the Jews interpret it. But I want to know, can you point to any Jew that tells that <clears throat> interpreted the Old Testament to refer to two comings of Messiah, one coming where he dies and they'll be raised from dead and a second coming from heaven. See, when you appeal to the Jews, the Jews are all over the place. No one Jew <clears throat> can be our standard of interpreting the Old Testament because no one Jew <clears throat> understands the Old Testament comprehensively and Jews are divided. For example, <clears throat> you had just because I want to make the point so people get it. When we keep saying Jews, 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 sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. For example, the Jews that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, they broke away from the temple in Jerusalem because they thought the temple was corrupt. They lived a monastic, ascetic life. Men were celibate. And to them, there was a Messiah from the line of Aaron, a priestly Messiah, a Messiah from David, and a prophet. Are they right? Or what about the Jews that asked John the Baptist? Ask John the Baptist, are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? Were they right? Because they thought the prophet was someone other than the Christ. Or are you talking about rabbinic Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, where it says there's a Messiah, son of Joseph, who will be killed in the battle, and Messiah, son of David, who will raise him from the dead. See, this is the problem I'm having when we keep appealing to sources that are inspired. They can be right. They can be wrong. Mm -hmm. if they want so to you're saying, yeah. sorry, did you? You're saying there's a potential that that is correct. Do you see that as at least a no, reasonable I, I, conclusion? I'll tell you where Abraham saw Messiah. Not in Genesis 17 and the laughter, in Genesis 22. That's the gospel. Oh, no, but I'm just saying, do you see that 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 do you see that as a possibility no, that can't. they understood it, that he was rejoicing that, no, that I he can't was going to have a child? No, I can't see that as possible because the context shows okay. he said mm -hmm. that uh, being incredulous. Here, let's let, let me look at it. Let's read it. Genesis 17. 15, we're going to read 15 to 18. Let's see. Genesis 17, 15, 18. If you want to turn there, you can read it. The context shows he's not laughing because of joy. He's laughing because he's incredulous. He's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm already 100. I'm 99. I'm about to be 100. Sarah's 89. She's about to 90, right? It's not a laugh like, wow, God, wow. Like, <laughs> come on. Man. You know what? Just bless Ishmael already. That's the context. You want to read it or want me to read it? No, no, no. I, I understand it. I understand when we read that Hebrew text. I agree. I agree that that's that that's the impression that we would get when we, okay, when we read that. Okay, can I just read it? Just, just I want to read it if you don't mind. If I just read yeah, it. Yeah, okay, sure. yeah, sure. Yeah, but God said to Abraham, "As far as Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I'll give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her." Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Can Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said "God to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. His laughter was one of incredulity, incredulity, as they say. Just like in the next chapter, Sarah laughed, and she said the same thing. She goes, I'm an old woman, and my husband is, is pretty much like a... With her twig. And then God said, why did Sarah laugh when I said that she's going to have a child? So the context of Genesis 17 and 18, Abraham and Sarah are laughing not because they're excited because they believe, but because they are <clears throat> doubting 
that they could have a child at that age. And so it's a laughter like, what? You got to be kidding. Seriously? Come right. on. I, yeah. I, I see what you mean. Uh, so let's say you, you, you said something about the uh, first and second coming. Can you clarify what you mean by that? What I'm saying, the Jews, the Jews don't believe Messiah would come the first time, be killed, raised from the dead, go to heaven, and then he would return from heaven to reign on earth. Oh, yeah. Now, do you believe that? <laughs> well, what I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying because certain Jews say a certain thing that, that every single Jew believed every single thing, because obviously that would contradict that they I believe agree. different things. I agree, but that's my point. Yeah. When I go to the text, they're clearly yeah. wrong. But you're saying there's well, a I mean, possibility they're right. Well, I'm saying no, they can be wrong, like they've been wrong on many other issues. Yeah, I mean, one, 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 one small point there. Um, one small point is that um, it, it, I, I agree that we have to be very careful when reading intertestament texts, and that each particular text should be taken and considered individually. Mm -hmm. But for instance, in the book of Jude, Jude appeals to the book of Enoch, which is an intertestament book. Yeah. Maybe he was using it for rhetorical purposes, That's but he fine. does appeal to it. And if we, if we don't know what the book of Enoch is, it seems that he almost accepted it as scripture. So, yeah, but uh, I even think if that he did, the, the audience. Go ahead, go ahead, make your point. I'm sorry. Sorry, I think the audience was the audience was well aware of many inter testament works. Okay, even if he did accept the scripture, that book is very damaging for the Unitarian position. Because in my article, I have quotations where in Enoch, the son of man exists as a person with God before the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars and identifies that son of man of Daniel as a Messiah. It calls him the Messiah. Do you accept that? I don't. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Enoch. Personally, I think there's a huge distinction between books like Wisdom of Solomon and Enoch. Uh, I don't I think that this gives proof that there are many traditions about pre-existing figures and, and mediating figures and that simply Christ was the true um, mediator and, and revelator of God. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's damaging to the Unitarian position. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that we should accept all of every single extra biblical text as as inspired scripture i don't want to give that impression yeah but andrew notice what you said let me repeat what you said the impression jude gives is that he accepts it as scripture so i'm going off what you said no, well let me no, just no, no, i'm just saying yeah. i'm saying i don't know if he did okay. and i'm not saying he did what i'm saying is that they were aware of it sure and that he paul, implemented that that, it, that extra biblical literature in yes. his uh, epistle but that paul also quoted pagan poets in acts 17 28 Sure. Aratus and Epimenides, he was aware of their literature and he quoted them, but it doesn't mean he thought they were scripture. So, but let's put that aside. If we go to Jude, even what he quoted, let's go with what he quoted. Let's assume, like in the case of Paul, he doesn't believe all of it is scripture, but it has some truths. The citation uh -huh. from Enoch is First Enoch chapter 1, verse 9 in the English translation. Obviously, the original Enoch, the book of Watchers, didn't have chapters. But in First Enoch chapter 1, verse 9, that's what Jude quotes in Jude 1, 14, 15, where it says, The Lord God will come with his myriads and myriads, right? And then punish the ungodly for their ungodliness, right? That's what he's mm -hmm. quoting. But in Enoch, yep. the Lord God who's coming with his myriads is not a creature or an agent. It's God Almighty. It is jehovah god or yahweh god yeah but according to jude that's jesus because jesus is the one who's coming not the father so do you agree with his identification as jesus as the god of enoch who's coming no i don't i what what, what i'm saying is that in the same sense paul may have appealed to pagan lit to ideas in the same sense you're saying that jude may have appealed to it what i'm saying is that the writer of the fourth gospel it, it, because he's the focus, especially of what we're talking about here, is that he was aware of what certain literature said, and that he writes his gospel sure. in light of in light of that to not clarify. Only, yes, things. not only in light of it, but to clarify and correct and bring out the true meaning. And that's exactly my point. There are sources before John where the word is not simply an idea or simply God's audible voice or God's command, but he's an actual divine person, divine agent in fellowship with God whom God sends to speak to his people. Now, they could be wrong, but then I see John agreeing with that part of those sources 
the Logos is a person. He is divine. He is distinct from God. He does appear. And now he's become the historical Jesus of Nazareth. So I use John to filter these sources. Okay, this is right because John says it's right and he's inspired. Now, if a Jew or an atheist or a Muslim rejects John, that's fine. I, as a Christian, take John as my lens. Okay, John, this part of this apocryphal source, that's right because you say it's right. This part is wrong because you contradict it. So that's what I do. So if I do that, I only have ample evidence that before John, the word wasn't simply revelation or an idea or a command from God or God's audible voice, but it was an actual divine entity, a divine person in fellowship with God, sent by God, identified as God. And John says, that is all true. And now he's the historical Jesus of Nazareth. But you don't want to accept that, but that's okay. That's between you and the Lord. I, I can't make you see. I can't make myself see. There are places where I'm wrong. Unless the Spirit shows me I'm wrong, I'm not aware of it. But you had a second yeah. question? Yeah, just one more thing. I don't want to tie you up. I really, yeah. really appreciate your time and no, doing this. I appreciate this. talking to you. Um, uh, yes, sir. You too. And uh, so so we, we talked earlier about how you, you agree that, that God – chose uh moses before the found that's extra that's extra biblical literature that says sure. that moses was chosen and formed before the world existed but we we agree that it's referring to full ordination not literal existence sure. and in the book of jeremiah it says that jeremiah was known by god uh, yeah several places in the new testament it says that even christians yes. were chosen in christ before the foundation sure. of the world and so in our debate discussion uh we, we i brought up the point about being sent yes and so so we we read that jesus was consecrated and so was jeremiah mm -hmm. and we read that jesus was consecrated and sent so he's consecrated first yeah. and then he's sent i just wanted some clarification yeah. about i mean do you, do you see where i'm going do you see the, you know, the, the line that yeah. my reason being sent and consecrated doesn't necessarily prove pre-human existence yeah and that wasn't my argument i didn't say being sent or consecrated proves pre-human existence it goes beyond that it's the language used in context where jesus is going to the father is personal and actual and then also i would like if you can maybe it's there because remember i i'm i don't know everything in the bible that's my goal to know it and live it out but can you show me in the old testament where it says moses came down from heaven or Jeremiah came down from heaven to do God's will, or the apostles came down from heaven to do God's will. That's the first thing mm -hmm. I want you to show me. And secondly, as I mentioned in our discussion in John 16, 25, 31, which is also in John 13, 3, it says that Jesus came from the Father, came from God into the world, and was leaving the world to go to God, to go to Father, to, to the Father. Mm -hmm. One place it says the Father, mm -hmm. the other place it says God. And as I said, in those places, for example, in John 16, 25 to 31, it says that I came into the world. I came from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. The phrase to the Father is pros tan patera. And then in John 13, 3, if you read that, it says Jesus had come from God, right? And then was going to God, pros tan theon. It's the second part that I was focusing on, if that's actual and personal, that Jesus actually went to God as a person, went to the Father as a person, then why do we then allegorize the first part of that statement? If the second part is actual, literal, no one denies that Jesus went actually as a person, a living person to God, then why the first part is not actual, personal, it's simply allegorical. You yeah. can't do that in, a, in one verse because it's a historical narrative. If one part is actual, why isn't the other part? Right, yeah. No, I see your line of thought. I think I think that's a good point for your case. All right, thank you. So I see, I see your line of thought. Uh, it's, it's, it's a legitimate point. Um, I, I still see it as figurative. Oh, that's okay. my point. Sure. I, I, so at the same time, with all that considered, um, uh, I, I asked you when it was that Jesus was saying, you, you, you told me that he was sent because he was the son of man, 
but I'm no, not asking the cause of why he was sent. I'm just asking at what point yeah. was sent because yeah. let's say that Jesus did exist. Let's say that God, God somehow had a child without a mother. That's possible for God. I believe anything is possible for God. I, I base my understanding off what the scripture says, not what's logically possible possible at all you know every single thing I, I, but at the same time i believe the scriptures are 100 percent logical um well when you, know, you say on, logical on the, on, the, yeah. on the big points one one um, thing though would be free said uh the same bible from a to z says god is beyond your comprehension yeah. uh, his ways are past finding out there's nothing like sure. god in all creation so logic has a limit mm -hmm. and revelation has to take over but go ahead make your yeah. point yeah yeah great point that's a great point um so what, what i'm saying is that it, at, at most, let's, let's say that God, hypothetically, for the sake of conversation, had this child. It was produced out of him because that's yeah. that's but the I don't feel believe that. Yeah. I don't believe he was produced What's out that? of him. See, the way you're speaking, it's like yeah. the son, yeah. even before he became flesh, just came out of God and wasn't eternally with God. If he's the word of God, he's always been with God. There was no point in which the word wasn't with God. That's the point of John 1. So I wouldn't use that language, but make your point. Yeah. Okay. Well, the and I was I would say why was the father called father and it was, was would you say that the son before the time space continuum yes. before would you say that the son was the son then yes and, and why father. was he called why were those specific titles used of son yes. and father because father means pro progenitor one who that. has the ability to impart life where yeah. son means progeny which one is is one who's capable of receiving life from that person yeah it can mean that not necessarily because the assumption in your question and i know where you're going with this that a father gives life to a son so the son comes later so the father antedates he's older than the son no not true i don't know if you have children do you have children i do I've, okay i do your oldest child, I'm not asking for the name or the gender. The oldest child, how old is the oldest child? Four years old. Four years old. Okay, God bless your children and preserve them for the glory of Jesus. And I pray that for you. Now, listen to my question carefully because it's not a trick question, but some people misunderstand the question. As a father, as a father, how old are you? Uh, my age, I'm 37. See, no, see, that's what I didn't ask. I said, as a uh, father, how old As a father, I've been a father now for four and a half years. So that means a father is only old, as old as a child. Without a child, you can't be a parent. Well, I mean, if we don't count the conception, maybe maybe five years if we count conception. Whatever it is, forward. but you're proving my point. You only became a father when a child was conceived. You were not a father prior to that. So it's not true that a parent is older than a child because without a child, you can't be a parent. So even in creation, that's not true. Okay. That's a false statement. So if God is the father and that's who he is, that's his identity. And the New Testament says that. How can he be a father and be self-sufficient and not need creation if there isn't a person who's just as old as him to make him a father? Because if you don't believe God is the father and that's his, his identity, then you believe God became a father and he needed creation to be what he is. So he's dependent on his creation to realize his well, fatherhood. Well, I think the first time that God is called father has nothing to do with us, with, a, a, with, with a son, a godson. So what, it has to do with father? the first appearance of him being called a father is when he, you know, figuratively gives birth to Israel. And it makes Israel his firstborn. But that actually and, proves my point again. For him to be a father, there has to be a child. Prior to Israel, he wasn't a father of any nation. But then in Genesis 6, you already have sons of God running around before Israel in Genesis 6. Well, if you have sons a, of God, then you have a father, right? It's a being and a person who ha has taken the title yes. and role of a father. And right? then you make my point, though. You're making my point that God is yeah. a father because of creation. Without creation, he's not a father. But then how do you explain okay. Ephesians 3, 14, 15, that the reason why God created families from the beginning is because he is a father. He created mankind yeah, to okay. be a family. And he says all the family, yeah. all families in heaven and earth originate from the source, God the Father. So that means there's something about God that goes about creating families. And that something is because that one God is the Father. But okay. I'm back to square one. Now let me just make, finish the point. Yeah. I'm back to square one. If the one God is the Father, and that's why he goes about creating families, Father is a relational title. 
you have to have someone you're a father to. Otherwise, you're not actually a father. And if God is sufficient in of himself, doesn't need creation, and yet he is a father, that means he has to be a father to someone that's not part of creation because God doesn't need creation to be what he is. Who was that someone? Yeah, so so let's so let's play this out, okay? Yes. Hey, let's visualize this for a second, okay? So I see the, that there's one being who is unipersonal, who is called the Father, and that's who I see as God, right? But what you're saying is essentially, let, let, let's say that there's somehow. Now we get. Well, let's not get caught up in yeah. in language. Let's just yes. understand what I'm, I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is there's essentially two beings. There's one being well, it depends how you define the term being so even yeah, exactly the language is yeah different. exactly that's why i didn't being want to get into say, that yeah okay well, let's persons. just say two let's persons, say persons. Yeah, yeah go ahead yeah yes okay so there's two persons there so at some point i mean you know we, we talk about time we know it's outside of outside of the time space continuum but at, at some point there's activity occurring they're not just stagnant they're just not just frozen mm -hmm. there's something occurring outside there and so at some point if 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 father is something that one becomes, yeah. at, you know, at no, but the father some didn't point, become the father. At, he's always been the father. That's my argument. He's always been the father, because he's always been the father to the son. Yeah, That's but, my but exact that, my okay. point. Then what I'm asking you is that why is he called father? Because he is the source of deity that the son and the spirit eternally partake of. It's and this is not me. This yes. is Hebrews one three. The analogy. Where in Hebrews 1.3, okay. it says he is, because i got to give you the analogy to see how something can be the source and coexistent with the things that derive their properties from the source. Mm -hmm. And this is Hebrews 1.3. In Hebrews 1.3, we're told he's the radiance of God's glory. You look at any lexical source, you know, I'm not making this up. The word apogasma means the outshining of a shiny object. When you have a shiny object like the sun, it then shines, it radiates light to us. So the light, mm -hmm. the source of that light is the sun, the sun in the sky, right? Okay. Because it's the source, it has the same essence, the same property that the sun has. But the sun cannot be what it is if it doesn't have light. If there's a moment in time where the sun, S-U-N, doesn't have light, it's not the sun. It becomes a supernova. So you can have something that's a source of another without the other being later in time. That's my point. God the Father, the source of deity, but the Son and the Spirit have always eternally <clears throat> been one with the Father, always eternally mm -hmm. partook of the Father's essence inseparably. So he never became the Father. He's always been the Father because the Son has always been his Son and the Spirit has always been his Spirit, even though he's the source of both. Yeah, so you're... You're agreeing with me that the Father is the source. Sure. Why wouldn't I? That's biblical. Okay. Great. So that's what I'm saying is that you have this other person who has, in using your words, derived properties. N so, not in so time. So See, even the way you're using it, it implies. So it's like well, Eve, Her she derived her properties from Adam. Does that make her less human than Adam? And fear no, I'm Adam? not. Yeah, I'm not arguing. Arguing, yeah. I'm not arguing um, properties because you said I'm not, I'm not properties. arguing. I'm, I'm not that. arguing properties. I'm arguing more um, uh, attributes and characteristics. Yeah. Well, yeah. You said derived properties, so I'm using your language. But even yeah, attributes, right. characteristics. But, but, the, but we're talking about abstract things that are not. That, no, that's God is not, not abstract. That's not God is you, reality. That's that's. Is, is, see what I mean is I I can. I can go and appeal to extra biblical literature, and when you get into talking about properties and things like this, that's that's also extra biblical. Although I I understand what what you're saying with Andrew, let me just comment with, on that. with Hebrews. Okay, yeah. and let me comment on that. There's a difference between using extra biblical language to accurately explain the Bible, and extra biblical sources that contradict the Bible or are not supported by the Bible. They're not yeah, the same. Know. So that's, that's what you. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I sorry. Okay. No. Good. Go ahead, make your point. Uh, yeah, so I, I agree. What I'm saying is that the the the, the language of Trinitarians yes. of this consubstantiality and things like yes. this one is ambiguous. So your average no, Christian not. is not going to understand that. I don't, and, and 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 Trinitarians disagree. There's no univer, univocal um, uh, uh, teaching yeah. on on exactly what those things are. Even sure. Trinitarians disagree. 
to yeah, be but, among, amongst Angela, themselves. And this is this is extra biblical language that yeah. I believe is is contradicts the scriptures. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's be fair. Even your brand of Unitarianism, you started this by saying you're not like other Unitarians. Your view of the Logos is different. So even Unitarianism is not monolithic. So if I use your standard. Unitarianism yeah. has to be false because you're not consistent. You don't have the same view. You don't interpret God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in the same way. So that doesn't really prove much, does it? No, no, yeah. Okay. No, so that, feeling to differences among that Unitarians. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I base my understanding off of what the Scripture okay. says and or in every single context that we have. Um, and that's what I've been doing. But uh, let me just give you one that's passage, what I mean. Just one passage about God being the father, that's his identity, and he's the father to the son. But I need to see how you explain. If you can read New Revised Standard Version, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Uh, let me like turn to it, sorry. Yeah. First Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to, here's what I, you, you, yeah. we'll reread in your translation, because I want to ask you a question. Yeah, sure. I, just, you know, I got a whole video about this Excellent. on my YouTube channel, and Excellent. I think it's not misunderstood, but, That's but okay. we, can, we can read it. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear I want to hear what, what, how you understand it. Yeah, um, yeah so 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, yes. from whom are all things and for whom we exist, mm -hmm. and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things things and through whom we exist now my question is the first part when it says from whom are all things what are the all things there from god are all things what does that mean yeah i go over this in my video That's and fine. i think it's all things um, pertaining to um i mean i go i, I go yeah, off and in my us. video it, it's mentioned in first corinthians it's uh thing, things pertaining to what is first of all it's it's for us is pertaining to christians it's it's, okay. it's not pertaining to everyone in the universe he's saying for us no, or that's in Corinth the second and christians part. everywhere that's no, no. what it says when he no, opens but that's up the his second letter. part you no, i didn't oh. ask about the second part. Uh, that you're you're explaining the first yeah. part in light of the second part no there are two statements there from whom are all things and for whom we exist so that all things are not the same as the christians we christians exist for god but all things are from him so they're not the same they're not they're not synonymous terms. If you want to force them to be synonymous terms, that's, again, an illustration of not allowing the Bible to speak clearly, but making it fit your assumptions. So, no, 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 what do you well, – so what do you uh, – okay. I, I, I guess I what? didn't really follow. I'm, I'm okay. sorry, but what, what are you saying is all yeah, things I'll, there? Yeah, I, I because, again, I want to see if you agree, but obviously you have a different interpretation. Where it says from whom yeah. all things means all things that exist, meaning all created things mm -hmm. are from God. God has willed their existence. Yeah. And then we Christians – are so, for him we we are created for him to live for him but you yeah, don't agree that I mean, all things are from god meaning all creation no, I, I don't think the context yes. allows for all of creation to be spoken about but i yeah I but I, uh, this, i'll tell you I why this, yeah. I, I encourage you to watch my video because i give what i believe yeah. to be sound exegesis sure. and, and, I, and I want I'll, you to go over that can i share with you why because you're already committed to Jesus can't be the agent of creation. And you see the dilemma that passage poses because if from all things means all creation, then if from all things are from God through Jesus and God exists before all things, all creation, then by necessity, Jesus has to exist before all creation. And you can't have a Jesus that exists before all creation. So you have to explain it in a manner that's a, that agrees with your posi position. And that's no, no, what's no. happening. Yeah. I think that it doesn't. I think that it works against how you understand oh, wow. and everything. Let, let's 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 Explain grant it to you for the sake of conversation yeah. that Jesus was the mediator through which creation happened. Sure. Let's grant that to yes. you, okay? But but that uh, but but that still doesn't make so the source is God. The sure. source is Yahweh. But he's Jesus where is Yahweh, so this, he he's is. essentially the he's the uh, the mastermind who orchestrates everything that happens. Yeah, but notice what you did. You assumed Yahweh is one person. If Jesus is oh, the oh, agent, yeah, yeah, the Father. Okay. If Jesus you. is the agent that the Father used to create, and he's involved in creation personally and actively, yeah. along with the Spirit, that means Yahweh is no longer just the Father. It by necessity has to include yeah. the Son and the Spirit. There's two reasons. In light of the Old Testament, Yahweh alone by himself created all things he made yeah. the heavens by his hands and yet we go to hebrews 1 and it says the heavens are the works of jesus's hands 
If the Bible is consistent, Jesus has to be part of the identity of Yahweh, or we have a contradiction. Hold on. Right. It, it, Hebrews 1, ten to I'm not aware of anywhere that says in yes, Hebrews right 1 that, that, that Jesus, Jesus is involved in creation. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, which you're going to have to explain away as well, because it says, in the beginning, O Lord, and he's the Father speaking to the Son. That's my point. Any oh, passage, Hebrews 1. Who Hebrews 1, 8. I thought you said no, 8, 1. No, no Hebrews you. 1, 10 to 12, which the context is yep. the Father speaking to the Son, and he's yep. just attributing the this, this Psalm, Psalm 102, 25, 27, which is about Jehovah, not a creature, yeah. What Jehovah's done, yeah. and he applied it to the Son, which you have yeah. to explain away, which is my point precisely. No no, I, don't what to, I don't have to explain away. It's so do you agree difficult Jesus created to explain. Heavens and it, it, it could be explained biblically using the okay. Bible only. What creation is Psalm 102 talking about? Well, I don't I don't well, I don't want to stray too far off what we're talking about. Right. We're, we're, well, anyway, we're, that's we what can saying. get into that. We can get into yeah. that at a different time yeah, if or, you want, or, or just, later. Here's the thing. We've Ask been, Marlon. We can do a, chat, uh, uh, a talk on Hebrews 1 like we did, John. Ask him to set it up in the future because it's not I want to shut this down. I'm enjoying this, but it's been over an hour and a half, and I got people that have questions. So so yeah, sure. contact Marlon. Yeah. Say, hey, Marlon, we want to do something on Hebrews 1. Let's do a discussion on Hebrews 1, Lord willing. We might do it on my channel, but it, it's been close to now two hours, and it's not I don't want to talk to you, but yeah. there are some people been waiting, and I need to get to that yeah. because it is late. I understand. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Too. Okay, folks. All right, guys. It's open for the rest of you. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I know uh, uh, Christian Esti was tired. Thou shalt not pontificate. Are you here? We're going to have to retitle this, right, first and last? We're going to have to retitle this, right? We're going to have to say something about Trinitarian versus Unitarian debate part two. Oh, you love love me? How did you guys enjoy the exchange? See, this man is a very honest, sincere man, and he's not argumentative, and he's not blasphemous. So these people I can deal with. Someone who's not blasphemous, someone who doesn't insult the Lord Jesus, I love talking to them. But you saw one thing that was quite clear today. You saw no matter the verse, no amount of evidence presented can get them to accept unless the Holy Spirit by his grace, by his power, sets them free from their presuppositions and their shackles. Because no matter what you say, nothing you quote is will be good enough, right? Nothing you quote will be good enough. But you know, by the grace of God's spirit, he's troubled. Because he reached out, he wanted to talk to me again. That means he's troubled inside. He's being shaken inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, why even waste time with me? Okay. But anyone have any other questions? The, the Skype is open, or you can ask in text. How long has it been? We're going to retitle this, Trinitarian versus Unitarianism, Debate Part 2, or Dialogue. No, that's good, because that means he's rocked. It's not that he's so, he's rocked. Anyway, no questions? If not, then we're going to call it a night. I know Marlon was here. The Gospel Truth was here. John 3.8 is not talking about tongues. Your friend can say what he wants. There's nothing in the context about tongues. Uh, come on, Al Alpha and Omega. I know you're pulling my leg, right? You're kidding, right? No one has questions? Give them my Skype name. It's Benny. Yeah, you did. Underscore Malik 3. No, he's not literally Elijah. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, meaning he's empowered by the Holy Spirit to do a work like Elijah did, but he's not the actual historical Elijah. And that's what the Jews were asking. Was he actually the historical Elijah? No, he's not. And Jesus doesn't say he is because the actual Elijah appeared with Moses as a disembodied spirit. And that Elijah is not John the Baptist. So Jesus says that John is Elijah means he's an Elijah type, a type of Elijah, because he's empowered by the spirit of God to do the work that Elijah did. Right. But he does it for Yahweh in the flesh. John the Baptist does it for Yahweh in the flesh. So no, he's not the literal Elijah. He's an Elijah type, empowered by the same Holy Spirit that empowered Elijah to be Yahweh's spokesperson. And John the Baptist, as an Elijah type, is empowered by the Spirit to be Yahweh's spokesperson, who's now flesh, Yahweh in the flesh. According to Jesus, that's already been fulfilled, Christ the way 24. Malachi 4, 5 to 6, already fulfilled in Jesus. And according to Gabriel, it's already fulfilled in Jesus. I'm sorry. 
Malachi 4, verses 5 to 6, according to Gabriel and Jesus, already fulfilled in John the Baptist, so that don't be surprised if the actual Elijah doesn't show up for Jesus' second coming. Because if you go to Luke 1, go to Luke 1 and read 17, you'll see Gabriel quotes Malachi 4, 5 to 6 as being fulfilled in John the Baptist, right? So don't expect Elijah to show up. If he shows up, I won't be surprised. But good question. But if he doesn't, I won't be surprised. I don't have a view on a black Hebrew Israelite. It's obviously, it's a cult. Anyone? Saved by Jesus. I wasn't asked the question about speaking in tongues, but no, it's not just human languages. It's also a heavenly language of angels. But that's for another discussion where I go in depth. Let's see if there's a question where it's going to be relevant for everyone. And I can answer without going into one hour dialogue. Uh, I don't know. All right. And no one? And no one's calling in. Everyone's afraid. Hey guys, I just want you to greet Leland Johnson. You guys see that name Leland Johnson? Do you everyone see it? I'm gonna answer this question for him. He asked me a good question, so stick around, don't leave. If you see that name, befriend him. Leland Johnson was my former pastor in Illinois. Uh-huh. I don't know. Hey Dale, why are you calling me when I'm gonna take Leland Johnson's question, you little sinner? What's up? What's happening? Hey. Hey, good night, uh, Sam Shmo. Okay, good night. Bye-bye. Bye. You said good night. Take care. Bye-bye. No, I'm good. You said good night. I don't... Just kidding. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. Because <laughs> you said good night. Be careful, man. You're going to get your wish. <laughs> Anyways, I have a question. Um, I mean, you said uh, this could be relevant to everybody because I, everyone wants to... I mean, I'm in that predicament right now. Everyone wants to um, get married and, and, and um, have kids <laughs> and all that craziness, right? Yeah, you're asking the wrong guy, man. My marriage failed, but go ahead. But, but hear me out. Hear me out, though. Hear me out. Um, because nowadays, and especially in America, mar um, there's a lot of divorce marriages yes. in America. Uh, I believe Satan has attacked yeah. marriage tremendously horribly. Yes. Especially in America, my question is: um, Is do you think the marriages are are being ruined because of 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 the roles 100%. that are being reversed? Hundred percent. In the West, it's a concentrated effort by Satan to feminize men and masculinize women. Men right. have become effeminate, <clears throat> and women have become masculine. Hundred percent, and that's also evident in the gender confusion of course this is a mastermind of the devil when you make a woman a man and a man a woman then you destroy the order that god has designed for marriage and of course it's going to fail nothing will succeed that opposes god's will nothing will succeed that defies god and his, his prescribed will you will fail you're bound to fail and we see it because you cannot falsify god's word you cannot falsify the bible 100 percent mm. Wow. Is is there a scripture that, that explains? I mean, I knew that Paul was was even when informed of the church. What do, you mean? what do you mean scripture? About what exactly? There's a lot of scriptures that talk about the consequences of rebellion. Romans 8, 18 and 32 is the clearest. I mean, so when you well, say scripture, what scripture? What exactly do you mean? I mean, like scripture that talks about how the world, uh, world <laughs> how the world. How the roles will be reversed are, uh, are not, not black and white. It doesn't come out black and white. But the the implication is that if you oppose and defy God's order, expect chaos, destruction, confusion. <clears throat> and that's what you have in Romans 1, 18 to 32, where it talks about God's order in creation. And what happens when you oppose it, what you do is rampant sexual immorality, rampant <clears throat> idolatry, rampant chaos, hatred, suppression of God's truth. So you get a list there. But the clearest expression of what happens when a woman assumes the role assigned to a man and what happens to a man who assumes the role assigned to a woman is Genesis 3. It's right there. Genesis 3. What, what's, what is the one of the main problems with Genesis 3? Why did <clears throat> Adam and Eve do what they did? And oh, what are we to learn I know from that? Huh? I know what you're about to say. What am I about to say? Tell me, brother. 
you're you're about to say that um because Adam listened to um Eve. No, not that Adam listened. No, not at all. That's part of it. That's what God says. It's more than that, it's more complicated than God saying, because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate of the fruit. Who was who was conversing with the serpent? Um, um Eve. Who was responding to the serpent? Eve. Where was Adam? Oh. Adam was, um, I guess he was in the garden. He wasn't there. You sure? The text says he was there, right next to her. Really? Was, wasn't was Eve was the one that went to her, the, the husband after she spoke no, to her? No, she the, didn't go anywhere. He was right next to her. It says he, she gave it to him, Adam, who was there next to her. It doesn't say she went looking for him. In fact, when Satan speaks, he's addressing both of them. He says, God knows that when you both, both of you eat, the eyes of both of you will be open, and both of you. So right there you see the problem. Adam is letting Eve <clears throat> engage the serpent. Adam is letting Eve <clears throat> have a conversation instead of stepping in and assuming his role to protect her and also to silence the serpent. He lets Eve take over, converse with the serpent because Adam became submissive, subservient to Eve instead of assuming his role as her guardian Silencing the serpent and telling Eve, don't listen to him. We listen to God. That was role reversal right there. Wow. So yeah. from the very beginning. That's right. That's why God said what he said. It's not simply obeying your wife. Because if you go to Genesis 21, God says to Abraham, when Sarah says, send away Hagar and her son. He says, listen to your wife. Listening to your wife is not bad. It's when your wife tells you to do something contrary to God's will. That's bad. But the sin of Genesis 3 is instead of Adam stepping and saying, hey, what are you doing? What are you talking to my wife for? I'm her head. I'm a responsibility. You talk to me. Yeah, God said, don't eat of the tree. Take a hike. But instead, he let Eve engage the serpent and he let Eve call the shots. And he followed Eve's leading as opposed to putting her in her place because she was about to sin against God and stepping in and stopping the conversation. There was reversal of roles right there. Wow. So it, when, when you're speaking just now, something just popped in my head saying like that's could be a reason why why all these single mothers and and creating all these feminine boys. And exactly. And uh, feminist. I'm telling you, it starts from the garden. Uh, a serpent is much smarter than you think. And that he knows if he destroys the family, he destroys society. Why? Um, dysfunctional parents produce dysfunctional children. And those dysfunctional children become our senators, become our leaders, become our judges and lawyers. They become those that influence society and they wreak havoc on society and destroy it. And this, this also goes back to what you're, you're teaching um, that I was listening to earlier, how, how, you know, we talk about the boss and, and how if you destroy the boss, then a lot of people are going to be infected, uh, affected. So if yes. you destroy, you know, the father of the oh, household. hundred percent. hundred percent. Wow. This because Satan is smart. Satan knows human psychology. He knows it starts in the family. He knows if he can destroy God's structure for the family, he will then produce dysfunctional children psychologically, emotionally traumatized, scarred. And then they become the next generation of adults. And then they create havoc and chaos and destroy society. That's what you're seeing in front of your eyes. All of these adults were the children of someone. And if you go back and you look at their background, I guarantee you they were raised among dysfunctional parents, either divorced parents or abusive parents, something, because that's how Satan knows to destroy society. I destroy parents. I destroy kids. Kids become the adults. They destroy society, wreak havoc and, and chaos. He knows. And he, he knew that from day one because what did he do? Notice his strategy because people need to read the Bible with the depth that is necessary to bring out all these deep theological truths by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. If you go to 1 Timothy 2, when you have a chance, you can read it on your own. You read 8 to 15. Paul says that Eve was deceived, but he doesn't say that about Adam. Now, let me bring out the implication. I did a session on this, but I'm going to bring it out. And Pastor Leland, don't leave. I want to answer your question. Um, so please stick around. I know it's late for you guys, but hey, we don't always get an opportunity where the Lord Jesus brings us a humble Unitarian ask sincere questions and get his foundation rocked with the hopes that he'll become our Trinitarian brother. But now, with that said, let me come back to you. The reason why she's deceived, now I'm going to show you Satan's strategy. 
The implication of Genesis 2 and 3 is God never told Eve directly about the forbidden tree. He left that to Adam. God told Adam directly in Genesis 2, 15 and 17, you are not to eat. But he entrusted Adam with the responsibility of then telling her. The fact that she could even question whether God said what he said means she was questioning whether her husband had actually conveyed God's words correctly. In other words, it wasn't simply an attack on God's integrity. It was an attack on her trusting her husband to lead her. Wow. You understand that? So, so that's the first. That's the first attack on the husband and wife. Uh, uh, Satan knows if I can get the wife to doubt the husband, there goes the marriage because it's going to cause chaos. It's going to cause fighting and eventually divorce. So he made her doubt not just God, but her husband, who was the carrier of the message. So in doing what she did, she was basically telling Adam she doesn't really trust his guidance and his leadership. She's going to take matters into her own hands. She was undermining her headship, overturning her headship. My body, my choice. That, yeah, that basically. Or in this case, well, you know what? Maybe Adam doesn't know what he's talking about. And maybe Adam didn't hear correctly. Maybe, you know, so many maybes. So not only is she questioning God, she's questioning Adam because the implication of Paul's word is God never directly told her, don't eat. He left that to Adam. Adam, she's your partner. She's your spice, uh, spouse. You're her head. You tell her. You you teach her. You guide her. So it's an attack on the husband and wife relationship and trust from day one. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, so Genesis 3 explain. is the classic passage to show you what happens to people when the family unit is destroyed when the woman becomes the lead, the man, and the man becomes the woman and sub submissive and sub you know, subservient. That's what you see in Adam. That's why God got upset. You listened but, to your wife to disobey me. You knew better. You did not simply hear it secondhand. You heard it directly from me not to eat of the tree. But you went ahead and obeyed her because you chose her and her wishes and her desires over my will. And that's what happens to any marriage. When you choose your wife's desires over against God's will, when you know those desires are sin against God and God won't bless it, your marriage is doomed to be destroyed. Wow. But the, the funny part about this, this is the last thing before I go, because I know you have to answer that guy question. But this, this is the funny part about this, is that I, I noticed that this feminist movement has also hit the Christian churches. The females, the, the female Christians are, I don't know if they're not reading their Bible, but the female Christians are pushing this feminist agenda sure. in the churches. Yeah. Yeah. And even uh, females are becoming, you know, um, bishop in a whole church and pastor in a yes. church. I don't know if you can't be you a know. female bishop in a pastor in a church. That's not biblical. But one thing I want to share with you, don't be surprised they're doing it. Everyone does it. The Unitarian was doing it. Unitarian would not allow the Bible to say what it says. He had to explain it to agree with his assumptions. So these women who feel emboldened and have become masculinized, can't allow the Bible to put them in their place, their proper place, because God doesn't put women in their place to degrade them, right? Their proper place. The Bible has to agree with their view. Women can assume all the roles that men do, and in fact, at times, do a better job than men. And that's when they bring destruction and sin and chaos. Okay, that's what you want to do. Reap what you sow. Wow. Anyway, Sam, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to go on the answer in Islam because I've been on that website a lot lately. It's a beautiful you. website. I recommend anyone to check it out. That's right. And keep praying for our holiness, our purity, our devotion, our ministry, and my daughters, and for the support to glorify the Lord. So praise yeah, God. Been, Good question, man. Been doing that. Thank you, Sam. Bye. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Okay, now I think my pastor is here. Okay, guys. Uh, Leland pa Johnson, you still here? Don't call me now, David. Don't give him the Skype name. Don't call me because i got to answer the pastor's question if he's still here if he left then that's fine don't call me right now because i don't want to hang up on you he's gone did he leave all right if he left then i'll give you the number david hold on let me see because i don't want to make him wait i guess he left oh he's here okay folks again i was trying to introduce him uh al uh, by the way leland that was al you know al al mary i don't want to give too much information leland johnson was my pastor in illinois and i mentioned him and i'm not saying in front of him 
He's one of the few pastors we have in America that loves the Bible and does all he can to understand the Bible and try to live up to the Bible and produce a congregation of people who want to follow Jesus and follow his word. So he's a rare breed now. So pray for Leland Johnson, pray for his ministry, pray for his church, pray for his wife and son, uh, because you don't find many men like that. In fact, just to tell you how hungry he is for the word and how humble he is, he's here asking me to answer questions for him. How many pastors, you know, would do that? How many pastors, you know, would come and yeah. ask, ask someone, hey, uh, can you help me answer this question? That tells you he's all about Jesus, not about pride. He wants to know Jesus more intimately to be a blessing to his church. So pray for this man. Now, are you asking me, why did God allow Jacob to defeat him in a wrestling match? Yes, that was my former pastor, Christos NST, uh, in Illinois. When I saw him, because he left Illinois, I left Illinois. So if he was here, I'd be going to his church if he was here. But he's not here, and I'm not going to say where he's at. I don't want, you know. That's Muslims can find me. I don't want them to find him. Anyway, um, if you're asking me why the wrestling match and why God lost this wrestling match. In fact, this was WWF WrestleMania before WrestleMania. Okay. Praise the Lord for what this man of God said. You see what this man of God said, Lyndon Johnson? You will learn more from Sam than you will in seminary. And he went to seminary. To me, that is one of the greatest blessings I can hear from a humble pastor of the Lord. Did you hear what he said? God bless you, brother. Oh, man, that blessed my heart. Thank you, Lord. It's all from the Lord. Okay, now let me answer the question for, for my dear pastor. All right. He's asking about Genesis 32, 24 to 30. Genesis 32, 24 to 30. There, Jacob wrestles a man, and the man can't overcome Jacob, and Jacob prevails. And the man says, let me go because it's daybreak. He goes, no, I will not let you go until... You bless me. And so if you read Genesis 32, 27, 28, here's what we find. Let me explain what it is. Good question. I'll end it with this. Christos and Esti, I love you, brother. And thank the Lord that he gave you grace that you can tolerate me when I'm tough with you. God bless you. Christos and Esti is risen. Genesis 32, 27 to 28. I love all you guys, man. Really. I don't love you perfectly because I can't. I'm not perfect. But anyway, Genesis 32, 27, 28. Read this. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. So if you read all the way, how do we know this was God? Let's read verse 30. Verse 30. How do we know it's God? And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Peniel means the face of Eel, face of God. Why did he call the, that place the place? The face of God. I saw God face to face. My life was preserved. But then you read in the context that God couldn't defeat him in a wrestling match. He was struggling with him physically. God said, let me go. He goes, no, until you bless me. He goes, okay, what's your name? All right, you're no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. Now, what's the point of all this? If you want to understand the point, you got to start reading from Genesis 29 all the way to 31. And then Genesis 33. Okay, let me sum up. What the point is here. Jacob was given the name Jacob because he came out grasping the heel of his brother Esau. So Jacob means supplanter, but also means deceiver. And if you read the story of Jacob, his mother and him deceived their father Isaac into thinking Jacob was Esau to rob Esau of the blessing of the firstborn. And when Esau found out, he swore he would kill Jacob and Jacob out of fear fled. Fled, took off for his life because he, he lived up to his name, a supplanter, a trickster, a deceiver, a conniver. In other words, Jacob was a good Muslim, but then he repented and became a good Christian. At one time, he was a Muslim, a deceiver like Allah and his messenger, and then he became a good Christian, a holy slave of Jesus. Amen? I had to just throw that in. Right? Everyone with me there? Just kidding anyway. All right. Now, with that said, okay, are you with me here? Follow with me. Let me see this guy. Okay, now. All of a sudden, he's about to meet Esau. He hasn't seen Esau for years, and he's deathly afraid. Esau swore to kill me because I robbed him of the blessing of our father. So he's afraid. And also, he's running from his father, Lebanon, because Lebanon turned out to be a worse crook than Jacob. He connived Jacob 
because Jacob worked for him for seven years to marry Rachel. But on the wedding night, he gave him Leah, not Rachel, connived him and said, you got to work with me for me for another basically seven years. And then I'll give you Rachel. So Laban turned out to be a greater conniver and crook than Jacob. And he kept scamming and deceiving Jacob of his wages. So Jacob's life is characterized by running, deceit, conniving, trickery, and he being connived and outwitted. All right. Finally, this man shows up. Let me give you the point. Finally, this man shows up and Jacob is aware that's God appearing in a physical body. And so he's struggling. And God is saying, let me go. And he goes, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. And then to show you how powerful God is, that God could have snapped Jacob like a twig. It says that the man touched the hip socket, wrenched Jacob's hip socket out of place so that from that day till he died, he walked with a limp just from one touch. You understand the implication? If this man wanted to, he could have snapped Jacob like a twig. You understand the implication? He could have snapped Jacob like a twig. And Jacob himself knew that this man could kill me dead. Why? Because Genesis 32.30, notice what he says again. Genesis 32.30, notice what he says again. And I'm going to explain the name change. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So he knows seeing God brings death, but God in his mercy did not kill me dead. So what's happening here? Why is Jacob winning the wrestling match? Let me give you an analogy. It's like a parent who knows he can harm his son and actually kill his son, who then wrestles with his son, but doesn't exert maximum force allows his son to wrestle and struggle. He doesn't make it easy, but he doesn't make it too hard because he wants to teach his son and discipline him. So what is God doing here to Jacob? He's telling Jacob, enough running, enough conniving, enough scheming, enough scamming. That's not how you're going to get the blessing. You want to get the blessing? You have to face your trials and by faith prevail and overcome them, and then you'll receive the blessing. That's what he was teaching him. That's why when he says, what is your name? Jacob. He goes, no, your name is Israel. You will no longer be known as a supplanter and a deceiver because that's what Jacob means. You'll now be known as Israel, one who wrestled and struggled with God and man and overcame. Here's your blessing. Because you finally faced up to your struggles. You finally faced up to your challenges. You finally wrestled with your problems and you didn't give in you didn't run away you didn't use trickery you faced them and you endured till you overcame them and now the blessing now you know how to get my blessing jacob you don't get my blessing by being a deceiver you don't get my blessing by being a supplanter you don't get my blessing by conniving you don't get my blessing from running trust in god face your problems and i'm with you and you will prevail, and you will rule with me. That's the lesson he was trying to teach him. Now, let me show you Genesis 32, 28. Here it is. So you got a filthy dog whose mother is a dog who's swearing. Send this dog to the doghouse, you filthy dog of the devil. Genesis 32, 28, swearing like a dog, you filthy dog. You wouldn't say that in front of my face, cussing that out. But anyway, it's okay. The Lord will deal with you. And he said, then now this is the man saying, thy name shall be called no more Jacob. In other words, it's not that you won't be called Jacob. It's even after that he was called Jacob, meaning your characteristics will not be such where people know you for being a liar and deceiver. Your nature will no longer be that of one who deceives and connives and supplants because I'm changing your nature. With a change of name comes a change of nature. I'm now going to make you Israel. Why? Because you're going to be a prince. Because the word Isra comes from the root Sar. Sar means prince. I will now make you a prince with me. Why? Because you struggled with God and man and overcame. And because you struggled with God and man overcame, you now will rule with me. Now, guys, can I ask you a question? When did he struggle and wrestle with God and men? When did he do that? When did he struggle and wrestle with God and men? 
When did he do that? And he overcame and received the blessing. When did he do that? Guys, right there in the chapter. That man was God. So in wrestling with that man, he was wrestling with God. So he wrestled with the God man and overcame. Right there. The chapter. That man was God. God appeared as a man. And in wrestling with the man, he was wrestling with mankind and God and overcame. He goes, in wrestling me, you have now prevailed with men and God and now have received the blessing. Catch it now? Did it make sense? You catching now? You making sense? That was a man he wrestled with. But that man was God. So it's two birds with one stone. Wrestling the man, I was wrestling God. And when I didn't give in, I didn't run, I didn't connive and cheat, but struggled and fought until I forced him to bless me, I now overcame God and men. And now I rule with God. Yep, it was Jesus. Which part do you want me to explain again, Cruz? I thought it was clear. This man was God that Jacob wrestled with and did not give, give up wrestling and did not let him go until he got blessed. And in struggling and wrestling and, and exerting strength until the man said, okay, I bless you. And doing that, he finally prevailed. He didn't give in. He didn't run away. That was Jesus' daily light. That was Jesus. No, he didn't even prevail over men, Leela. No. If he prevailed, he wouldn't run. That's the whole point of the story. Running from men, running from Esau, running from Lebanon, conniving Esau, cheating Lebanon as Lebanon cheated him, that wasn't prevailing. That was his point. Stop doing this, Jacob. Stop being a supplanter and a deceiver. You'll no longer be known as a supplanter deceiver. You're now going to be known as a ruler, a prince with God, because you finally faced your struggles and then you overcame them. He never prevailed with men. Prior to that, he was running from men. He was lying to men. He was conniving men. He lied to Isaac. And when Esau sw swore to kill him, he ran. When Lebanon was cheating him, he ran. His life was characterized by running from his problems, not facing his problems, and by lying to get his way and to get himself out of problems. And God says, that's not my way. That's not my plan. That's not my purpose for you. That's not how you're going to be blessed and reign with me. That's not my way. Yes, TBL. All that time, the devil was winning because Jacob was doing the devil's will, Satan's will, carrying out the desires of Satan. Because anything that's contrary to God, sin, lying, cheating, kidding, that's of the devil. The father of lies and a murderer. Okay, Freddie, you're not getting it. Who told you that when Isaac blessed Jacob, God honored that blessing? You're still not getting it. Who told you that when Isaac blessed him, God honored the blessing? He never did. So you're confused again. Don't confuse Isaac's blessing with God's blessing or God honoring the blessing. Are you guys getting it now? I was about to thou shalt not pontificate. Who told you that was God's blessing? See, this is where you're going to get confused, Freddie. And don't confuse yourself. Don't be that blind to think that because Isaac blessed him, God honored it. God didn't honor it until now. He says, now I'll bless you. I was talking to Freddie Cruz, but I hope you got it. Yeah, well, it wasn't. He didn't run to God. No magnificent prophet. No, who told you ran to God? God showed up to wrestle him. He wasn't looking for God. God appeared. So no, he didn't run to God. God appeared when he realized it's God, right? He started then, okay, bless me, God, like you said you would. But God didn't make it easy. He exerted enough strength to show, no, you're going to have to earn this blessing. 
You're going to have to fight for this blessing. You're going to have to face me and overcome me to teach you a lesson. Because think about it, folks. If you can overcome God, you can overcome the world. If you can prevail against God, which force won't you be able to prevail against? Is there a force you won't be able to prevail against if you prevail against God Almighty? So that's what he's teaching him. If you prevail against me, you can prevail against anything, Jacob. You want me there? No, it's changing sub subjects, King of Assyria. And I don't know if you're asking sincerely. It has been answered for thousands of years. Because your name, King of Assyria, I don't know if it's the name because you believe in Ashur, who all dethroned by King Jesus, but anyway. Everyone with me there? Did you get the answer now? And Pastor, did you get the answer? Because I'm going to tie it in with Jesus now. Uh, if, uh, Freddie, there is no authority for a woman to be a pastor in a church. There is none. You have to twist the scripture for that. So that's my answer. You decide what you want to do. Okay, I didn't know, King Assyria. Don't get angry, Aziza. I didn't know because your name scares me. We have a lot of people that are like pro-Assyrian. Allah Hashur! You know, so I, I got to be careful. Anyway, Pastor Lynn, did you get the answer? Did you get the answer? I'll, I'll give you, well, I'll give you a link where it answers the numerical discrepancies. Tectonics.org. Do me a favor, King of Assyria. Go to tectonics.org. And they have a section on Bible contradictions. Check it out. Because I'll answer in a future session. I can't. But I guess, Pastor Lee, I don't know if you listened. I hope you learned the an heard the answer. Because I'm going to tie it in with Jesus now. I'm going to tell you who that man was. Okay, so it made sense. Pastor, there's no follow-up question? No follow-up question? Did you get Is it clear? Or are there some points you need me to address? Okay. Pastor Lena, is there anything else you need or is that sufficient? You got it? Because now I'm going to put the icing on a cake and we're going to go out with a bang. I'm going to show you who that was. Remember, he came out of the womb grasping his brother's heel. He wrestled with God and prevailed. Okay. Let me show you who that man was who was God. Hosea 12 verses 2 to 5. The book of Hosea verses 2 to, 12, 2 to 5. Watch here. And we're done for it tonight, folks. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings, will he recompense him? Now watch. He, Jacob, took his brother by the heel in the womb. That's Genesis. And by his strength, he had power with God. That's the wrestling match. He had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him, the angel, and found him in Bethel. There he spake with us, even Jehovah God of hosts, the, the Lord Jehovah is his memorial. Did you catch it? That God who appeared as a man that Jacob wrestled with is the angel. And that angel is not a creature. That's Jesus appearing as the father's messenger before he became flesh. Meaning Jacob wrestled Jesus. And Jesus allowed him to overcome him. The angel of the Lord. And on my YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, look for Angel of the Lord. I provide proof from the Old Testament that angel is not a creature. He's distinct from God the Father, sent by God. He is God, claims to be God, does things only God can do, is worshipped as God. And the New Testament says that one became Jesus. There's your Jesus wrestling with Jacob. Praise you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are in love with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Cover us by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Bless these sessions. Bring more people. Lord, in your grace, bless this YouTube channel to explode for the glory of Jesus. And keep filling me with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Make me holy and in love with Jesus. And provide so I can do this to bless the world. And thank you for all who attended. Thank you for Pastor Leland. Bless him, Lord. Shine your face upon him and all of us. And please, my God, Father, Holy Spirit, shine your face on my daughters, my angels. Cover them by the blood of Jesus and seal them by the Spirit. And keep using us to glorify Christ until he returns, until he takes us home. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. More of Jesus, less of us.
Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. God bless you. Amazing night tonight. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Christ is risen.